Knee on the lift. Back attack, dude. <laughs> Fun boy on! Hey, your homie's good. Slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. All right, welcome to The Bomb Hole, which is presented by Pub Beer, purveyors of cheap fun. On a dry spell, reach for some courage. Pub Beer, facilitator of cheap fun. Now, today, co-hosting, we got my dear friend, Hava Fernandez, marketing <clears throat> guru, worked with David and I in the past. That worked for Solomon, uh, Stance, Nike. How you doing, Hava? What's happening? I'm doing wonderful, Chris. Very happy to be here. A little bit itchy. Mm. Feeling good overall. Love that. Thank you for the analysis. We also have uh, Silk D, our producer back there. Silk, what's happening? Not much. I'm not itchy over here. I'm doing like good. That. Haircut's looking good. Yeah, you know, give it a little fresh trim the other day. Nice. Love that. Really straighten it out. Yeah, keep the bangs dead straight in the front. Yep. Love that. Yep. And today we have a huge guest. We got David Benedict in studio. What's happening, David? Not much. I'm happy to be here. A little, little bit nervous talking about snowboarding. Don't really know what itchy being itchy means, but I just get a little itchy when I'm nervous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's right. natural. Oh, okay. Yeah, then may, huh. I might be a little itchy. Yep. Well, Hava also has crabs as well, so that's in the crotch <laughs> region. It's debatable. Yep. So, Anyways. okay. Uh, for people that don't know who David is, uh, David is a two-time rider rider of the year. He's an innovator of tricks, jumps, progression. He's one of the most influential snowboarders to ever do it. He's an author. He wrote the current state of snowboarding. He's co-founder of Robot Food, one of the most iconic video franchises of all time. He's gone on to be a producer and a director of snowboard films, and he's even stepped outside the snowboard industry and spread his wings creatively in design with a design agency. So uh, it's going to be a great podcast. I'm excited for it, but I think we should start with our day yesterday, riding Brighton in the powder. Uh, How was it for you, David? It was good. It was good. It was a little extreme. I realized uh, going snowboarding with current professionals is a lot harsher than going snowboarding with other old people. So I was like, when uh, oh you were you were sending me, you were telling me like, go, it's great, back three it, and I just I thought he kind of like thinks about my age and everything, and I did a back three, landed a bomb hole, and no no shit, I tomahawked like like I haven't in like twenty five years like. Like five flips. So. <laughs> how's uh, how's the bod feeling today? It's feeling all right. I felt my neck this morning when I woke up. So I was like, yeah. well, "Thank you, Chris." I also have to say, I'm, I'm going to say you're mm. riding in a backpack. It was a powder day, and it seemed as though you're almost a little top heavy because when you started tomahawking, it was That's like our, a pendulum. Our high center of gravity, yeah, high center of gravity. effect. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's good. It's incredible, man, going up there and just seeing like everybody and like. I don't know, like 20 current pros, and then there was like Seth Hewitt and Jeremy Jones in the lift line and stuff. And yeah, it's thinking it. if you know if you're, I don't know, anyone who's like excited for snowboarding, like would lose it, lose his mind. Yeah, it's got to just be wild showing up at Brighton on a powder day yeah. nowadays with kind of the snowboarding contingency in and around Salt Lake City. You got Blake Paul launching back threes, and you got Mike LeBlanc sending cliffs. Parker Zumowski's out there flying off of stuff. Got it's David Benedict ragdolling. Yes, down. that was <laughs> yeah, that was the highlight. Yeah. Absolutely, but you did land a beautiful back three <clears throat> earlier on that other step down. Thank you. I would say the back three that you tomahawked on was not operator error. That was poor guidance. That was that was my fault. Not sure about that. Because when he had a clear landing, he was good to go. But it was funny because I was riding in, and he's like, back three, it's fine. And I, the first thing I see when I'm at, like, 270, I look in the landing, I see a rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think I, that's also, like, the Brighton style. It's like everybody just goes for it. There's, it doesn't matter if there's, if there's like, you know, if like a couple inches on, on rocks. You just, you right? just got to land on your feet. Yeah. Board down first. No. But I have to say, like, just, like, in all honesty, it's pretty amazing seeing – like that much of like a snowboarding hub and like how many people and how excited and just the the powder panic of people who do it professionally and just I don't know it felt like I don't know it felt like a very alive scene which if I think about most of the European resorts I go to it's like the only scene that exists is like Apreski you know what I mean so it's yeah I it's really that. cool and bef- and previous to coming to Brighton, you were able to go up to Baldface. It looked like you had a pretty elite crew up there. How was your experience? Did you hit it good? Yeah, hit it really good. I mean, Baldface and just like everything that you know Jeff has built up there 
is just incredible. And then, like, I went there. When, did we go together with Hava um, with Pierre like 10 years ago? I can't remember. I'm not sure. To be totally honest, I don't yeah, want to sound You've been up like there so idiot, many times that you don't really remember. No, it's not like yeah. that, but, you know. I, yeah. But I think so that, like, you know, when, uh, I don't know, somebody asked me if I was, like, nervous to come come on the bomb hole, and I realized, like, I'm not really that nervous because I'm just, like, more, like, grateful to be part of the snowboard thing, you know? And, like, I think that, so that bald face trip really was, like, an epic start to that because going up there and seeing, like, a lot of people I hadn't seen for 15 years, 20, Rob Campbell, who was on the trip, I hadn't seen for like 26 years. And, wow. you know, and then I go up there and there's like Gooch, um, Jamie Lynn, um, Wooly, uh, you know, Blue, all those guys. And it's, it's just like, I don't know, it just totally like catapulted me back into being this kid and just being just so friggin' excited about it, you know? And, and also just, I think being just really grateful of being part, being somewhat part of this community, or, or I don't know, I don't know if, at least like yeah, a, a sense of belonging. So maybe this is maybe first of all, thanks for having me because it, it feels more like we're here to, or for me to be here to like reconnect to something I like that that was so important in my life for so long. So um, yeah, I don't feel like it's about me; it's about like snowboarding. Oh. I'm pretty excited about that. Amazing. Yeah, do you ever find that uh, when you do reconnect with snowboarders specifically that you haven't seen in a long time that you can, sure, there's plenty to catch up on, but you can almost like pick up right where you left off? Yeah. I feel like that's kind of a special, one of the special things about being a snowboarder and connecting on that mm -hmm. level totally. is that you can do that with people. I had, I, I, I spoke to this about, uh, uh, to mm -hmm. Blue Montgomery and the fact how crazy it is that we grew up, you know, like 10,000 miles from one another socialized by exactly the same music, the same fashion, the same heroes, you know? And that is something that's pretty unique, I think, about snowboarding. Or maybe also about the time back then that there was like a singular messenger, you know, a couple magazines, and mm -hmm. just like almost like this guidance. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes, I feel like I feel like it was like a high school reunion without ever having to go to ever having been to high school with these guys, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's definitely certainly more of a shared experience with like a more unified message that was happening because there wasn't like a fractured media yeah. and internet and yeah. everything all over the place. I mean, it might still be the same. I think I would, I mean, got to have, got to ask uh, like Blake and those guys, I'm sure if they go to Austria and they, they connect with, you know, the writers of, uh, you know, whoever's written, who they're shredding uh, with there, um, are you laughing about me just like? No, I was just curious which Austrian writers <laughs> that you were thinking of. <laughs> Pava putting me on the spot, yeah. So, yeah, we've been <clears throat> joking a little bit about being out of touch. and. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. We are thrilled that you're on the show. Uh, if you were to tell my 14-year-old self uh, watching Robot Food that you'd be sitting here talking to me on a podcast, I would have, I would shit, I would be shitting in my my pantalones, so to speak. So um, this is really excited. I think we should just change gears and just sink our teeth right into robot food right out of the get-go. Get the elephant in the room out of the way. Go head on into it. Um, and obviously you're coming off a of film in Standard. I'd love to for you to divulge in what made the switch happen and, and why you started with robot food. Um, I mean, so I don't know who said this um I think it's snowboard related the other day, but like that it's so much about being at the right place at the right time, you know? And so I, in a way I feel like, like this is just like a total, like random, you know, coincidence of, you know, going to a contest, ending up a standard, um, getting to know UC and all those guys and kind of riding with them. And then they break off. I'd almost say, I don't have any legitimacy to claim any of robot foods initiation because I was, the, the Grom, the noob, you know, I was the rookie on the crew. And um, if those guys would have said, like, let's, I don't know, let's just all do Big Mountain, let's sign a contract and film standard films, Big Mountain stuff for 10 years, I'd probably, you know, probably just tag along. So um, I think I was just really lucky, like, stumbling into that crew with Jess and Parker and uh, UC, Bobby, Etri that crew and just kind of like, you know, over a year and a half with Standard, uh, kind of becoming part of that crew. And then 
certainly being part of the conversation of like, ooh, I think we could we could kind of pull it off to make our own video. I think essentially, so if you're asking about how did that come about, I think we were really happy with working with Mike, who I, by the way, find it great that you guys had him on the show because he's the coolest dude. And maybe before I get into robot food, I just want to like, like articulate my appreciation for A, all that Mike has done for snowboarding, but also on a very personal level, um, my first kind of professional experience filming was, was with uh, Mike Hatchett. And so I was just super nervous thinking this is going to be gnarly. Like he films Johan, he films all these guys. I'm going to go out there and if I don't die, I'm like super, I'm just, you know, lucky. And then we go out and I think it was Yussi and me and we're like, we find this kind of jump spot. We're like, hey, what do you think, Mike? This is, is this big enough? He's like, oh, that's, he's like, that's not my business it's all you if you've whatever you feel comfortable with i'm just here to shoot and i was like wow that's incredible you know and then we ended up hitting like a 10 foot jump that never made it in the movie because you and i were just like i don't know probably just yeah you know we weren't really into like hitting something gnarly so that's also another another thing but like i think that's so cool because um such a responsible way of dealing with being a filmer and having, you know, having people in front of your camera that might go outside of their comfort zone, maybe too far. You don't never know. So I think he had a real cool and responsible approach to that. So that's maybe something I just want to throw out there and maybe it reaches him because I, I don't know, I think he's a really cool cat. And to some extent, I also kind of, I think we all sort of felt bad because we were really cool with Mike, but we thought, hey, I think it'd be cool if we made our own video. Like, I think we can pull it off and at that time, we weren't really into big mountain riding. Yeah, there wasn't any bad blood with Mike or anything. I think we just wanted to kind of break free and make our own video. And so to your question, kind of a little detour, but to your question, I didn't really have much of a part in founding Robot Food. I was lucky enough to be the noob on or the, the grom on that crew. Now, I get curious because the feel of the video is so much different than standard films or Mac Dog or any video in that time frame. Did you guys have a bit of a philosophy or a bit of a vision going into it? It's really hard to think. I'm trying to think back how much of a vision we had beginning to film or if that just evolved from like the group dynamic, which would be my guess right now because, I mean, there was always a little bit of, I, we f I think our crew, we felt like we were a little bit on the, like, polar opposite to wanting to be gnarly, like, and appear gnarly. I think we were a little, I think that was maybe the only thing that, like, was maybe a common thread that we were like, we kind of like snowboarding, we want to have fun. We're really interested in, like, technical progression and all that stuff. But really, like, we don't want this to seem gnarly, you know, and, and kind of have this, like, I don't know, like, just, like, Gnarly. seriousness yeah gnarly yeah. seriousness and and yeah so i think that was maybe the maybe that was something that that existed from the get-go mm -hmm. now thinking about that first part uh in the first video of the trilogy after bang you have last part and you wrote to video killed the radio star and pierre wickberg was telling me that that was intentional there was a bit of a thought behind that song I'm so brain fried. Probably so many con concussions that I can't remember. <laughs> um, trying to think. I don't think so. What did he say? I mean, what he told me was All that right. he likened it to, you know, almost like um, video killed the magazine pro was kind of, and then like almost in a literal sense of the editing where video killed the radio star in snowboarding, the video part killed the magazine pro, and this was a new era, so to speak, is kind of how Pierre explained it to me. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think, like, I would, I don't know. I, and then Instagram killed the video star. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I don't think so, because I know that we edited the part to, like, five different songs. Okay. I think. I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely, because my whole idea was, like, I would wanted to get, like, four nines in one video part, and I just forgot one because we had so many different edits with so many different songs. And then the final one that was exported, just we forgot one of them. And so I remember walking out of the premiere and I'm like, I was like, I kind of don't remember seeing that trick, you know? And then like, 
I had a good trick for the next year. But so to that point, I think I would believe that that kind of like meta level of the song is something that is most more like a rationale after the fact. I don't think that was intentional. Okay, copy I, I that. Think so. I, I don't, but maybe Pierre's, I don't, I'm really, um, you know, I seriously have some serious memory. <laughs> I do think it's worth noting for people that didn't live through that, like the all four nines things, that hasn't that hadn't happened at the time. And that was kind of a pretty big target for somebody filming a video part. So that was kind of a big, it's a pretty significant oversight yeah. Yeah. going into that movie. It's just so funny, look, look at it from today, you're like people warming up with like four 12s or something. And you're like, that's kind of cute, somebody obsessed about <laughs> getting four 900s in a year. It's like, how <laughs> pathetic is that? You know what I mean? It's like, it's pretty funny, right? It's um, So, yeah, but I don't think, I mean, yeah. I wasn't crazy bummed when that happened. Oh, you weren't? Like, not really, I think like, because I think I was happy with what it was, and and then that I was just ah, let's just push that to and next so year. And so then you went into the you went in to the next year with the front nine in the timeline already. Totally, it's pretty in nice, June. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, amazing. So whose fault? Let's just be really clear. Yeah, whose yes. fault exactly was it that the nine hundred wasn't in there, Pierre? Or let's I just I want to point some blame here. Let's just just for the fun of it, let's let's point it at at Pierre. Yep. Yeah. Probably yeah, or Gibby. Let's shout out to Gibby. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Jake Price seems like a pretty likely culprit. I know yeah. he wasn't editing the film, he but editing. he did have his hands, his yeah. hands, his fingerprints were on no. the project. No. Mm-hmm. Well, he no. did have another monumental screw up. Jake Price did uh, a few years later, right? Yeah. Maybe we just get into that real quick and go back to robot food. Yeah. I mean, I mean, screw up. Yeah, things happen, but like, uh, but so years later, I made ninety one words for snow. And the idea was to have like all these different types of snowboarding um, in one film. And so since I knew that we wanted to go with the best rail guys there were, I called Michael LeBlanc, asked him like, hey, could we send a filmer? Can see, could we send Jake with you for like half of the season or whatever, do some trips, document everything, and then we do a footage trade. His, we get his action, they get our, our angles, etc. He was totally cool really supportive. By the way, the first time I, I think I reached out to Mikey, or we got to know each other, kind of just like via email. And uh, and then, yeah, so Jake filmed with those guys for, I, I, I would say like three long trips, like a lot of material. And then uh, somebody broke into his car in Portland, I think, and just stole all the footage. Everything, no backups, nothing. <laughs> and I remember he called me, and this is like, you know, it's also funny because you go out, you know, you, 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 you kind of like make all these great promises to sponsors. You oversell the shit out of a movie. You know, you, you make these like pitch decks and it's going to be the greatest thing on the planet. And then you're like, you sit there in like June and you're like, or whenever that, you know, April, you're like, we don't have any footage. This sucks. And so um, I called Mikey and he basically just saved my ass. He gave me all the footage, just everything. So all the footage we have in 91 words was um, from, from Mikey's film. You know, so um, thanks. Shout out to Mikey. Like, big shout out to Mikey. Yeah. Legend. I mean, absolute legend. yeah, absolute legend. And uh, and also kind of cool that we connected that way. So, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, so we lost a bunch of footage, but I guess that happens. And I don't know. I, you, you, you were asking me about whether I was mad, and I don't remember if I, if I was or not. Because I... Price yeah. told me that when you told... When he, he was terrified to call and tell you this, he was like mortified. Imagine this new young filmer filmed an entire year with, you know, for this project and then lost all the footage. And he said that you just started laughing when you told him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because yeah. it doesn't really seem that like, it seems like, I don't know. I don't know how, how well you know me, but I can like kind of get tense and, and kind of freak out when it, when it, so. This seems more like a psychotic laugh than like, <laughs> yeah. than like, a, um, I was, I was pretty obsessed back then. I mean, I'm, yeah, I think that's also something it's like as far, as much as I like, as I remove myself from, from it now in terms of like responsibility and because I do find in all honesty, like without like trying to be just overly humble, I do think it's just very random what we do when we do it. And it's more like, I feel like it, you know, there's a torch coming, you pass it. It's like, so I, I don't feel in a way that I've like, like have that much responsibility in these things, but I know that when I did them, I was like, just like, 
fucking let's do it. You know, it was like really, and yeah, I could obsess over these things. So, um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe I really did laugh and just, because I knew there wasn't anything we could do or something. I don't know. Well, talking about obsessing, uh, I thought this was really interesting. I, when I spoke with Josh Dirksen, he said, uh, quote unquote, I've, I've seen Benedict get hurt and learn tricks while he's been hurt. For example, he came back from an injury and landed a switch backside rodeo 900, like one of his first times back from snowboarding. So that makes me like, as you talk about obsessing, how much, how much time did you spend doing these tricks in your mind? Yep. A lot. I, I spend a lot of time doing those tricks in my mind. Like also like, I remember like when I, when I, uh, had to finish school and I couldn't really snowboard much, I had this like little Lego thing, which I would like kind of like try to, I remember just like really, really early trying to figure out how a hawk and flip worked. And it was like, what happens if you like move the, you know, you move the, the rotation axis this way, like how, what ends up, where do you end up at 720? Or you, you end up on your head or you end up on the side or something. I could kind of try to like, f- like understand the motion and then kind of like have that sink in hopefully over a period of time. And then, um, so I, I did really obsess about that stuff. And yeah, what about that trick specifically, the switchback radio nine? That's pretty funny because I, uh, I had, I don't know where that was. Either Red, it was Red an, Mountain? Re, either it was an interview or it was, I heard that, no, it was an interview. I read a Peter Line interview like four years before that. And I, I'm like, I was like, that was like, for a long period of time, that was like the writer I idolized, Peter Line. Just technically, you know, like all these different things, everything he did. And so he had an interview where, he, where somebody asked him, what's the most, what's the hardest trick in snowboarding? And he said, a switchback, switchback said Rodeo 9. And I was like, I'm going to do a switchback. You know, just fully just, I'm going to do that. And then I think I tried to figure that out. And, and then that's what Dirksen probably meant that I just kind of, I had to figure out by the time I tried it. Took a long time to remember that. Kind of tried to figure out what would happen if you do this and this. It seems super absurd because today everything's so much more complicated that you're like, you, obser- you obsess over something that's seemingly so, you know, like not that complicated. But yeah, it was com- felt complicated to me back then. So, so your first session ever try and switch back Radio 9, which I think the jump's in Red Mountain, is that no, right? No, it's, um, it's actually Cook City. Oh, that's Cook City. Yeah. Okay. So you landed it the first time trying it within a few goes. Probably, yeah. I, oh, I, I try, Yeah, I remember where, when I tried it. And then you did it on the park jump at the end of Lame, too. Yes, yeah. Same year. That was almost like a little scarier because then I was like, oh, this really needs to work, you know? But I kind of had figured it out, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, as a as a snowboard nerd, I noticed that your your fucking body mechanics are like in, incredibly good. The way you kind of pop and then turn, and you know, every, very deliberate in your motions. Where, like, how did you how did you dial in your body mechanics? How did you get so damn good at jumping? I I don't know. I don't I don't think I. I don't know. I think there are people like I don't know. I'm I'm almost the same way. Where I like I look at UC and I'm like that's like center gravity, like people who always rotate around like an inner core or something like, or uh, Guillaume Morissette. People just, they don't seem to ever be able to not fall on their feet. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think I've, you know, I have, I do have a little bit of like a, a structured, I, a structured way to approach these things. So I, I don't think I just randomly kind of just launched and tried stuff. I kind of tried to figure it out step by step. So I think, um, that might, might, yeah, might have made some some things a little more cleaner in terms of takeoff and stuff. But that's probably just like also just being scared of, of hurting myself. I think. I like that. Now going back, we we talked about after bang. That part's amazing. You have Ender. Um, video comes out. It's a instant classic amongst the snowboard community. Do you have Do you have any theories on why people love robot food so much? My thought was that people latched on to that same original idea that we had of not of not making everything about being gnarly and in a way like it's not self-praise, you know, it's about I think that's, I'm, right, gnarly, gnarliness, if it's kind of like displayed, it's like self-praise, right? It's like bumping, your, yeah. you know, like just kind of and so I think I would believe that's what people connected to is like, cause that is something that it's about having fun riding 
And then it doesn't really matter if you're doing like a 900 or a 360 or whatever. And so I think people connect to that because maybe because um, they were just, uh, it, it wasn't that um, available, you know? I think that was probably the main part. I think it was something that wasn't that available. I think it was more available probably 10 years before and 10 years after. But in that period of time, I think, um, yeah, it was, it was more about pushing the limits, going bigger, bigger. Every year it was like these jumps. I mean, that was a time when like jumps literally went from, I don't know, like 15 feet to at the end, like rises, you know, like uh, pyramid gap or what's the other, the other gap? Chad's gap. Chad's gap. Right. So I think I remember that I was seriously concerned about, about my health, like just watching it from the sidelines. I'm like, shit, this is getting really big. Like, <laughs> like I'm so glad I'm, I wasn't on a crew ever with rice or Roman. Cause I'm like, that would have been terrible. <laughs> Seriously. But you got, you hit some big ass jumps though. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I yeah, feel I like terrified. There, there's definitely something too. That was cool as a consumer. It was like seeing your, your, these super pros that you idolize. You, you did, ha- you, you had bangers. You guys were doing heavy tricks, but then there was that, that lightheartedness, yeah. the, the fun digi cam where you're seeing these guys be dipshits. There's and some silliness. There was like, a blend where he was like, we don't take ourselves too seriously, even though we're, we're the best. And, and that like, was very easy to latch on to. And even the, like the music was more upbeat. Good point. And like the yep. whole feeling of the video just was more light. Even though like there were still like some of the best snowboarding yeah. that was happening at that time was in those movies. It's funny how that uh, turned, that also like turned into a formula, formula real quick, right? You can, mm-hmm put in a banger, show a high five, and then like kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of like faking the fun. Like we were actually, even during after bang, we were, we were already like joking about it, like faking the fun. Like not because, like that was, most of it was pretty honest, but we were like, like there was, there was so much, like we knew when we were doing like the stuff that scared us and we were doing the stuff that didn't scare us. I think that mm-hmm. um, it was to some extent deliberate, I think wanting to portray it as being something fun, maybe to some extent more fun than it was while we did it because like, yeah, most of us I think were pretty scared or like most riders I think are, everybody's kind of scared mm-hmm. half of the time. Mm-hmm. So, Well, even, even I think about the shots too, like the, you know, you're snowboarding on a snowboard with like a 45 inch stance. That's just like your, your bindings are on the nose and tail and it's you just, you know, dicking off on this thing. And it's, it's like f- five seconds in the video, but, for whatever reason, it's so impactful because you're like, these guys are being dipshits. Yeah. What was yeah. the logic behind that thing? Yeah, I got to have ask uh, Bobby about it. I think he, he brought it to a Solomon <laughs> shoot at the, was it? Ke- uh, Ke- no, at uh, Bachelor. I wasn't at that one, but I know which one you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. It's one where Pat, Mo- uh, Pat Molodowski built us like the little like rail thingy with like going back up and down and stuff. I think he just brought it because he wanted to like fuck around on it. So. so it just had inserts like all the way out. I think he bolted inserts all the way out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's a, yeah, there's a bunch of goofy, goofy shit. Hey, Danny. What's going on, Silk? Uh, what is that? I'm glad you asked. This is the Turtle Box Gen 2 portable speaker. <laughs> Looks good. It is good, Silk. This thing is 100% waterproof. Wow. Will give you top notch audio quality wow all day on its 20 plus hour charge that's all day brother that is all day dot brother okay well that sounds good but you know what pisses me off about all the speakers that i have is i don't think one's enough i agree with you one is not enough but with the turtle box gen 2 portable speaker you can link them all together and get that true surround sound experience these things are top of the line no way i wouldn't i wouldn't lie to you i know uh yeah at the end of the day these things are extremely fun great for days at the mountain on water in the backyard me personally i use them in my van that doesn't have uh built-in speakers Ooh. it gets the job done oh i can imagine you got two in there running that full a b surround sound quality i am not but i need to get there okay well i think i know where we can find one turtleboxaudio.com all right. Well, we uh, we got a bunch more robot food to talk, but I think we should hit. Uh, I think we should hit trivia. Welcome to Run Through um, a Wall Trivia. Okay, here's the concept. Have you ever done a Run Through a Wall smelling salt, dude? No, never. Okay. Oh, I, I've never done smelling salt. Period. Well, get ready for uh, an exciting time. So get it wrong. 
You gotta, you gotta smack a salt. And how do, how do I smack a salt? What does that work? You just, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a demonstration. Right. You take the small salt, uh, you pinch it, and you just ease it up to your nose. Don't go right up. Just kind of give it a little like. Yeah, a little bit of taste distance. the water. Okay. Don't go full. Can and I try one pi- yeah, you crack a fresh one, Hoff. Get in there. Yeah, there we go. Now we're now we're talking. Okay, so <laughs> oh, he loves him. Yep, Hav loves him. So uh, it's good. What we got going on here for this concept, David, is uh, you got five seconds to answer. It's a blend of uh, German trivia and snowboard trivia and popular culture. Wow, it's gonna be all right. I'm excited. Oof. Okay, Hav, you want to give like a light, like five, four, three, two, one in the background to count it down, and if he doesn't hit it. Um, I'll hit the buzzer. Absolutely. So you're, you're a yeah. countdown guy. Yeah, I'll be the buzzer. I'll, I'll be the countdown. Okay, first question. What is the German concept that describes relishing in an embarrassing moment? Five, four. It's a German three. word. Oh, Schaden, Schadenfreude? Yes, that's correct. Right. Um, okay, what rider rode to This Is How We Do It by Montel Jordan? Five, four. This is Three, how we do two. it. JP Walker. That's correct. Woo. That would have been embarrassing for this n- is not how to get we as do a, it. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you got that one right. That would have been bad for your. That would have been bad. Uh, okay, whose ball sack is hanging out of their shorts? <laughs> Bobby Meeks. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> That's correct. Okay, what were you the... Want, you want to get to the end of the question so people know what he's talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that is kind of sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Confident answer. Whose ball sack is hanging out of their shorts in the outro of one of the robot food movies is the full answer yeah. question, and the answer is Bobby Meeks. Next question. What were the angles on the graphic of the original Solomon Prospect board you rode? Five. I would think four, 12, plus three, 12 minus 6. Two. We don't actually know the answer, so oh, we're cool. leaning on you for that. It was okay. actually it, it was actually plus twelve minus six. It Farco was. texted me uh, just really? a little bit ago. All yeah. right, so, all right, he's Correct. unscathed so far. It was actually I mean, different for the three stance, sizes, but so it was your stance. Bit, in the, yeah, yeah. You, it's yeah, your deal on that. What rider won the European Open in two thousand and three? Five, four, three. Two. Did I win that? Yes, you did. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> Got it! Wow. Jesus. <laughs> okay, in what month does Oktoberfest begin? Five. September. Four. Oh, damn it. I thought we were I mean, gonna come on, seriously, good. guys. I mean, somebody <laughs> we're from throwing Munich. them some change ups. We're throwing them some change ups. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe these are meatballs. It's going to get harder. But it's yeah. kind of, maybe it's a, good, it's a good info for everybody. Oktoberfest begins in September. Yeah, we're learning. People yeah, want to know. Good heads up. Yeah, I think it's a good so heads too. up. Okay, next question. What cartoon made fun of the Germans for not being funny? Five. We spoke about this. Four. South Park. That's correct. South Park. Funny Bot 3000. <laughs> the Funny Bot 3000. That. I love that episode. Dude. <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. good. Okay, what writer is quoted saying that Travis Parker is a crazy character? Five. Four. Three. Shit, I don't know. Two. And that he soars. <laughs> okay. oh. How's this? Yeah. There it is. Oh, it's nice. Wow. Look at that. Like a wine connoisseur. He looks yeah. like a wine connoisseur right there. He's really taking Nothing. it in. Yeah. Wow. This is like a tutorial on how to do this. There it is. There it is. Yep. 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 It's called a German whiff. It's kind of nice, yeah, man. German whiff. He oh, yeah. likes it. Isn't this the most elegant yeah. smelling salt experience yeah. I've ever seen? The bombhole.com. Yeah. I think this is the oh, proper is technique, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. This is nice. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought this was going to wow. be terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. Wow. I can smell it from here. <laughs> well tenured in that. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we got him on another one here. Which breed of dog that comes in toy, teacup, miniature, medium, and standard size comes from Germany? Five. Four. The German Three. Shepherd? Two. Poodle. It's a poodle. Really? Yep. You gotta do you gotta hit the salt yeah. again. What's a but uh, explain real quick because it just so so there's a toy poodle, a teacup poodle, a miniature poodle, a medium poodle, and a standard poodle. Hava <laughs> came up with that question oh, because he's is. a poodle. It's much stronger. Yep. He's yeah, got I came up with the question because Osimo, my daughter, just yeah. got a toy poodle last week or two weeks ago. And, and, and say again, like they come in. It was like its origin is in Germany. Poodle is, poodle origin is in Germany. Yeah. yeah. You learn something new every day. Yeah. I just learned that myself. Okay. What NBD never been done trick did Travis Rice do? On the jump from the gap session video. Five, four. Was it three, NBD? Double back, know. late back, 180 or something? I don't know if it was NBD, but it seemed like it was in the video, Maybe. the way it was portrayed. Yeah. 
Could be. Maybe possible NBD. Don't Alleged. Yeah. Alleged. Alleged. We'll say allegedly. It probably was. It probably was. I mean, yeah, who would have done a back double back, late back side 180? The, the only person, but probably, he probably He probably would did. Have, yeah, that know. probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Good probably logic. Travis. Is Makes sense. NBD. Okay. Uh, what does the acronym BMW stand for? Five. Come on, guys. Three. Bayerische Motorenwerke. Yep. Duh. What, yep. Was what does that, that mean? And what does that? I mean, that Bavarian, was a, it's like Bavarian Motor Works. Okay. Yeah. Those are some a lot of uh, consonants and vowels in places I'm not used to seeing. <laughs> I'm not sure I could pronounce it yeah. like him. Okay. In OptiGrab, what writer is quoted saying, "They tell us it's supposed to be sunny outside, but look out the window." It's right after your part in OptiGrab. Five. Thinking like Johan Olofsson. Three. Oof, close. Two, I'll give you one, one more chance. <laughs> Jeremy Jones. Okay. Big Mountain Jeremy Jones. Big, I know. Yep. BM, not BMJJ. Real, not the real Jeremy Jones. BMJJ. The big one. Uh, okay. Uh, what forest <laughs> located in German state of Baden Wurmutsburg <laughs> is also a variety of smoked ham? Also produced in Germany. Uh, Black Forest. That's correct. Pretty good on the German pop culture, Hava. Uh, I mean, he's, he's nailing it. <laughs> he's nailing, yep. He's, he, he can't miss. Snowboard trivia? We're going back to it. Here we That's going to be terrible. Snowboard trivia is going to be terrible. What is Chris Engelsman's last trick in After Bang? After, after Bang, I would... After Bang, five, 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 five four, three, two, one. Is it the one. Three, four to 70s line? That was in the credits. Shit. Switch I thought it was in the credits. Backside 360 on the road gap. Oh, wow. Did anyone ever appreciate that road gap? Um, maybe not. You can elaborate. Well, why don't we finish this and then yeah. we can elaborate on that. Nuts. Okay. What oh, chewy yeah. candy was invented? This is the last question. What chewy candy was invented in 1922 by Hans Riegel, the German founder of the confectionery, confectionery company Haribo? Oh, really? What's the candy also called? Herbie, yeah, it's probably Kinder. What real? No. What chewy candy was oh, it? Chewy candy. Oh, it's, then it's probably uh, gummy bears. That's correct. Yes. Uh, okay, let's go back to that switchback three on the road gap that Engelsman did and switch method. Switch method too. Did you check it out? Because I thought it was switch method and then I'm, I kind of wasn't sure if, I'm, if I was correct. We get it. I'm not sure. Did you take that from me saying it? He did a switch no, method? No, in my head he does a switch oh, method. Oh, in mine too. Okay, then it's probably because... I've just seen the road gap, and it's like a, it's big. I mean, there's like two lanes plus, I think, the side lane. And all I know is there was this much snow on rocks. In the landing? In the landing. Holy smokes. And so I think maybe, so that's, I just want to bring that up as a Chris Engelsman appreciation thing, because, I mean, it's nuts. I mean, he's, he was the original ATV. I, that's so incredible. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, I mean, most probably one of the most well-rounded snowboarders who ever lived. Agreed. And yeah. he also does the um, shoot where he rides onto the lo the road, like you know, basically yeah. like he, the, he hits the road gap, but then he does this like little yeah, line yeah. and then rides onto yeah, right, the pavement. Right. <clears throat> and that's those are the little details that also yeah, made robot true. food so special. Yeah. Is like I'm gonna ride this stupid line. Come hell or high water, and he was ready for it with the pants as well. That's yep. That's, yeah. that's true. Totally. There's a funny little side uh, note to that. Not sure how much Bobby exaggerated, but I remember he told me once that he, um, how was that? He, <laughs> I think Bobby wanted Chris to have like to not have high water pants, so he asked K two, or was K two his? K two yeah. was also his clothing sponsor. I believe so. Um, to make like custom longer pants. And he, which she then just like pulled higher, <laughs> where they were perfectly the same high water than all the pants before. <laughs> but the pants so were just pulled up to probably, your I don't know. Jacket. I'm sorry, Chris. If I'm like, I think that's like, I remember, I remember hearing that back then from awesome. Bobby or somebody. And I was like, first of all, it's really cool if like your friends are looking out for you that you don't have high water pants. Mm -hmm. But then if that's your choice, I think that's great too. It's like, <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and also, too, I don't think it was clickers era, but the clickers aren't helping anybody out in that department. The K2 clickers. Totally. You know, yeah. you got no high backs for the yeah. pants to rest on. It's, 
Yeah, that's not doing anybody favors. <laughs> now, I, I wanted to talk about, uh, maybe this is special to me. I think there's a lot of other robot food fans that would love to hear about this, but one of the greatest things with robot food was all of the bonus features. And there was, there was so many little nuggets and so much leftover footage and so many little Easter eggs and, and you could just really sink your teeth into like so much, you know, behind the scenes footage of a lot of it was just stupid shit, but it was awesome. Did you guys, you know, was there intent behind that? I think we just wanted the DVD to be more than just a film. I think that was, I remember we, we had, we spent like, I spent most of my summer in Portland at Nemo's office, kind of like doing like the packaging design and stuff, just kind of learning that. And I think alongside that, we kind of tried to figure out like, how could we make this DVD somehow like kind of cool or special? And, and we had so much, as he said, we had so much leftover footage that we were just like editing all these like little funny bits and stuff. And then, uh, I don't know who came up with the idea that we can, we could put like a code on the DVD and then release like little like secret bits one after the other. There wasn't much of like a media plan behind, you know, like you could like release this and then yeah. leads up to something. I think it was just kind of like wanting to fuck around with the medium rather than anything else. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that was, yeah, there wasn't much of a, of an afterthought or before, you know. So for people with distance to that, from that project, I know that there was like always a lot of deliberation about whether or not the Vlay bit where you're like, oh yeah, like people actually think Vlay's real. Oh yeah. Like Ex people, explain that. People. Specifically. Yeah. Well, I'll let you explain it, but there was certainly people that yeah. weren't, Absolutely. weren't sure that you were joking yeah. about that. Yeah. So we, um, I don't know who came up with it. I would think it's Travis, Travis Parker, that we were like, why don't we pretend like we have a behind the scenes thing and we pretend that it's um, like most of the stuff is animated. We had, you know, like there's an animation studio and stuff. So, so we set up, I mean, this was, it was, I remember it was really, really spontaneous. Somebody had like a wetsuit. We had some ping pong balls. Yeah. It was so <laughs> dumb. But the cool thing is we, we literally, seriously, we, I think we conceptualized and shot it in like half a day. It was just like, yeah, let's do it. It's be, it'll be fun, you know? And then we asked Kale to come in and, or Kale was there and be like, hey, could you pretend to be like the producer? And then, so maybe to explain to people who hadn't seen it, it's we made a behind the scenes for After Bang and we pretended that a lot of the snowboarding was animated or digitally enhanced, like jet riders were jumping higher, um, stuff was shot in front of the green screen. I mean, it was, it was to me, so obvious that this was obviously uh, satirical, you know, as a joke. Yeah. And um, so we put it in, we thought it was really funny. And then like a year later when it comes out, we get like, no shit, we get like 10 to 15 emails of people who are furious. Like furious, like they had always believed snowboarding, you know, snowboard videos were real. And like, we just totally <laughs> like, uh, just took that illusion and everything. And we, we were like rolling around on the floor laughing. <laughs> But then I think, of, of course, in just the bullshit manner that we were just like living our lives in, we answered them, <laughs> apologizing for taking their illusions, but that they would they should see what MacDoc does because they have like, <laughs> we told them that they like MacDoc. Advanced technology. No, just because, yeah, MacDoc, we said that MacDoc has the same technology that a, a Jurassic Park was made on. <laughs> I remember that. We sent those emails out and just like, just like super elaborate and just really apologizing <laughs> and then just going on in this total bullshit. Dude. It's, I don't know. It's so funny. I still have that email somewhere. It's so funny. It's, yeah. dude, I mean, it, we're just like, there were so many dumb. I mean, also we were like in our early twenties and not very mature. I mean, there's like, I, like half the stuff is so, yeah, it's dumb, but funny to us. You got V-Lay doing what's clearly just a giant frontside hair on, on a hip. It's clearly a giant frontside hair. And you just scrub the thing forward and you're just like, you know, he, he would be going here, which is like the beginning of his hair. But we just put him up here, which is the apex of his hair, which is like so obvious. And then you, you like, like anybody that, you know, knows anything about snowboarding could tell you it's not computer generated, but it's amazing that people bought into that. Yeah. Imagine if, if V-Lay would be real. I remember that. That's yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, that's like the, the quote. Said, like, can the you believe people actually believe re Vila is real? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's surprising. Like, I, 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 uh, I found it. You pointed me to it, I think. I think you pointed 
pointed me to it on Inst- on on YouTube a couple years ago, and I just kind of reshared like I screenshot it or something, reshared it on Instagram, and I watched it not too long ago, and it's like surprisingly well done. Like it yeah. feels like everybody's acting kind of like. The acting's okay. The directing is okay. You feel like, oh, this is a good skit. But remember, there was like nothing was written. It was just like, let's go. And and then Par- I mean, Parker is just incredible, right? He's just like this genius. You just put him in a wetsuit and then just hop it around. Hop there, around. there, like some of the ping pong balls were falling <laughs> off. One like, falls <laughs> off, and I remember the camera pans like falling the rolling ping pong ball. It's like that's so dumb. <laughs> yeah, that was a good yeah. crew. Uh, that was what it was all about. Now going to uh, so then is it? It's lame that you do the mirror mode. You wanted to do switch and regular, or is I believe. I yeah, was, yeah. Yep. I think I might have even started out thinking like it would be insane doing that for a full part. Yep. You know, I think um, doing yeah, doing like the first half regular, second half switch or something like mirroring all the tricks. And I was kind of obsessed and uh, with with trying to make switch tricks look regular and what it takes because I, I still, to me, I don't really understand why that's so hard. It wasn't, like, wasn't, this was after bang, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what did after, you say? after bang, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got my, yeah, my oh, wires crossed. I didn't, didn't hear yeah. that. But yeah. Um, so I think maybe, I can't remember, maybe my idea was doing that for the full part and like the only thing I ended up with was like the last 30 seconds or something. But um, yeah, that was, that was a thought. A little bit of like, a, I think those, you know, like trying to like find a conceptual challenge that you, you, you have for the entire year or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another Pierre Wickberg, he was claiming that Ardo Sari, because he had really sorry or sorry, he had the opening line that was switching regular, he had a mirror mode. He was like, yeah, I think that he was trying, he was inspired by Ardo Sari. Is this some more fake news from Pierre Wickberg? It's more fake news from That's Pierre That's what Wickberg. I figured. Well, speaking of I'm Pierre. I'm sorry, Pierre, it's just all fake. We, no, I don't know. I mean, maybe, it, you know what? It could be, but I'm not. I'm not even sure. I would think, do we know when these videos came out? Uh, two thousand three to f- or no, I mean, two like to- I'm thinking about Ardo's part. Oh, I don't know, yeah. Because I'm I'm thinking like the flip videos are after after Bang and all mm. that stuff. Yeah. I would think. Mm. Hard to say. Pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah, plus but or I mean, a year. yeah. Either way, I mean, I don't. You know, Ardo is no, part copy and David. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> no, but but uh, I think I mean in all, all honesty, it's like it's not the most creative thing in the world to be like be interesting to do the switch and regular. You know, like I think a hundred people thought about this. It takes like also like a lot of like persistence coming to the jump and being like this jump absolutely fucking sucks for switch backside. And then I'm like, okay, I'll just go and try. You know, so I think mm-hmm. yeah, you have to be kind of committed to that. I think to pull it off. Um, well, we've been talking about Pierre a lot. I think we should hit a guest question for Pierre Wickberg. All right. Here we go. Hi, David. I'd like to know how often your last name has been mispronounced or mistaken for uh, a certain egg dish. And I'm also curious to hear if you think there's ever been a pro snowboarder with worse snowmobile skills than yourself. <laughs> Love you. Hopefully we can make that robot food reunion happen before we're 50. Well, before you're 50 at least. Bye. Yeah, so question number one. Um, yeah, pretty much like all the time. Like my name is, like it's funny in Germany, my name is, it's like I say it, it's like people say Benedict. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> that's fine. Just roll with that because it's, I think it's like, it's like Hungarian, Austrian. So that spelling is just not really... Um, anywhere other than in Austria or in Hungary, I, it's being it's spelled right. But um, I think the more actually, like, more kind of like weird stuff to my name is actually in the United States, where it's like uh, Kevin Jones. Like everything is like oh, you've been such a dick. Like that's like the thing. Like every time it's like you've been a dick since I met you. Like that's like I I've, <laughs> it's like it's pretty it's okay it's kind of funny. It's like I didn't and. And uh, actually, the first time I came to the United States ever for snowboarding, I think in like probably like 97, going to Hood for a Hood trip. And I arrived and I, and how was it? I arrived and my friend who was already there tried to call me out um, like on the, at the, like the airport info, like the speakers, you know, like he went to like a info booth and asked him like, Hey, could you call my friend out? We can't find him. And the guy wouldn't do it. Cause he thought Benedict was like, uh, it's like, it's a- like a joke on, on like, like 
on dick. And it's like it, a see more butts. Or yeah. Like one of those. And so my friend had to get a cop to accompany him to the booth to tell him that that was real. And then they called me out. And so, yeah, there's, it's kind of funny because my name is, I think it's like pretty st standard or something, but it's like at the same time. Yeah. So it's, it does, does come up sometimes. That's a little. And part two is about your snowmobiling skill set. Yeah. It's pretty, I'm pr pretty close. Pretty, I mean, there's not many people who were, who were worse snowmobiles than I was, I think, but. I got around to finally like took. I think it just took me a lot longer, but like, yeah, it was terrible. I hated those things too. And it's like they're loud. They're they're really powerful. And then how about the paradox that you're scared, and that's when you have to gas, right? That's like I think that's basically <laughs> the essence of snowmobiling. It's like you think <clears throat> it's going like like things are really going south. You just need to like go, and that's something I, I yeah I didn't wasn't really able to figure out for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, going back to backcountry uh, snowboarding and stuff, like, I'm always curious. I don't know why I, I'm curious about this, but when I look at the timeline of jumps, I watch, like, old Whitey and even old Mac Dog and old Standard, and a lot of the jumps were just, like, kind of standard issue, just, like, piles of snow people would just shovel. But really, when you start seeing, like, the mega blocks stacked really high, really clean, and there's clearly, you know, squares that were cut with saws and built like an igloo, it seems like to me in my my kind of like timeline of watching snowboard videos that robot food was really on the forefront of building cheese wedges with blocks that were really high. Was that something you guys pioneered or am I wrong for saying that? No, I think you're right. I think it's pretty funny because I remember uh, on Lame, Scotty Whitley came out with us, right? He comes out and he's like, you guys aren't looking for jumps. You guys are looking for landings, you know? And I was like, oh, yeah. So it's really funny thinking about Robot Food as like a creative crew because like the way we used terrain wasn't very creative. To be honest, we looked for landings because we wanted to get like shots, do tricks. And then you have someone as methodical as Inglesman who's got like, you know, is, like he probably knows like what the standard size of block is to build a jump. And so, yeah, I think we just kind of, I don't know if... I think other crews did that too, but I think I would think looking at like MacDoc, they did a lot more like pat downs, just flying off of things in Whistler, and then the Euro like like Absinthe. I think there's a lot, also a lot more natural riding. So in mm -hmm. in a sense, where when I think of, when I'm thinking about that, I'm like, huh, that doesn't strike me as very creative, you know? Like and also like in terms of like you, we don't you really use terrain that much. I think then maybe what like some of us did on some jumps has a creative element, but then the actual, like how to use terrain is, it's a little straightforward. It's like, there's steep, let's build something for two days and just hit it. But you're right. I think, um, at least that era, I think everybody started doing that. Well, it did. So like in building all these jumps, and I don't know if we want to get to this at this point in the conversation, but you spent a lot of time theorizing and putting into practice like different ways of building jumps and approaches to, accomplish more airtime and like hit jumps in like bigger and sometimes safer or more often than not safer ways. Um, I think that'd be an interesting thing to talk about a little bit. And was any of that informed by like building jumps in the backcountry this way or like yeah. what, what was kind of the catalyst for some of that thinking? Yeah. Um, I think the catalyst, I think generally the catalyst to trying to build different jumps was just probably just being scared for the most part. I think just, uh, um, like we said earlier, that the jumps just like really grew in size in that specific time frame, right? Like of like what I don't know between like 2000 2005, I felt like the jumps just like get, were getting so big, and like Mods was doing like the world's biggest frontside 360, you know, 50 meters. That's like 150 feet and all this stuff. And I think so. The way you know most people had built jumps was just like take off a long deck and a landing. If you knuckled, then basically br broke both your legs or something. And um, I actually, I mean, it's weird. I don't never thought about it, this as a catalyst, but I did break my leg doing ju just that filming with standard. Last, obviously, last day of the of shooting is kind of dumb because you always it's always the last run when you get hurt. But like I, uh, I decked and broke my leg just coming kind of coming up short, and uh, I think maybe those things together, um, with stumbling upon a feature in the backcountry that was so much more airtime than anything we had kind of seen before, which was just like we stumbled upon this like 
hill in Aalborg that was basically just like a ramp and then almost like a step over with like a endless landing. And I remember we hit it and we were like, this feels like twice the airtime than any other jump. Plus, you're never high off the ground. And then how we we were starting to think like, who maybe we could recreate this kind of feature, and have a safer, have a safer way to like try stuff or yeah or even film if it looked good, whatever. But just I think um, that kind of yeah I think that primarily like the combination of probably being scared and then stumbling upon this feature that was significantly allowed for significantly more airtime the two put together kind of send us on this complete like path of just like trying to figure out how to build this, which, yeah, which took, yeah, took a long time to figure that out. Cause I mean that, that kind of changed the trajectory of like park jumps in a pretty serious way with like kind of rolling the knuckle up and like, you know, kind of following yeah. that model in some way. Yeah. And then it seemed, I do remember at some point, like in that you guys kind of went on this like, like speed became a necessary component of that. And I yeah. remember you guys even like clocked yourselves yeah, to see yeah. like how fast that. you needed yeah. to go. What sort of speeds were achieved like in that side quest? Um, yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, I think that was like a really good learning curve of kind of we, we we drew up the perfect feature that we wanted to create. And then Whistler Mountain um, uh, was up for kind of like we found a spot. We I, no, I think we actually sent out a pitch or like a little info deck to a bunch of people at resorts, be like, could you look for this kind, do you have this kind of feature? Because we would like, like to build a jump. And then um, uh, I think Mike Douglas from was it Mike Douglas from, from Whistler, the skier, he used to work at Whistler Marketing. He came back to us with, um, he's like, hey, we have a feature like that that kind of works. And then but we ne had never seen it. And then they were, kind enough to just be like, for months they were pushing snow, and then when we rolled up, it was just like so gigantic. Um, and yeah, and then we realized if if basically, if it's too much of a step up, you lose all your speed on the way up. And th in the bottom of the transition, I think I was going like, um, I know it was 124 kilometers, but that's like, I think it was 87 miles per hour. Oh <laughs> like I had a, I had a, oh I had a GPS in my jacket. Yeah. And I was riding crazy <clears throat> stiff boards at the time too, right? So I was like, I remember like- I hope so. <laughs> yeah, like my board was unrideable. Like apologies to anyone who bought it. Like not that <laughs> intentionally, but like like I told you, like I, 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 I pulled my, my pro model like out of my basement like a couple of years ago just for taking it for a spin because I was like, oh, I really like this board and took it out. And I was like, that's such a piece of, piece of shit. It's like, <laughs> it's just like super stiff. The thing doesn't turn before you go like 60 miles an hour. It's, it's, this board was made for like landing, not riding. It was terrible. Um, I mean, it was really well built, but like, I mean, I think that was, that's just how, what everybody wrote kind of. But yeah, so we figured out, okay, it's, it's yeah, sure, the, the jump might be safer once you're in the air, but if you're going like 100, you know, going 90 miles an hour, you're not going to go switch. Like all these things suddenly came and then we downsized everything, but kept the, kept the concept the same. And then I think maybe even the same year, like later we built another jump and then we're like, Oh, this is much smaller, but that felt doable. And then, um, it was indeed was much safer. I thought, cause you don't land, you know, if you knuckle and nothing happens. And, mm. uh, but also, I mean, Snowboard jump, jumps, if they're built for filming, right, they also have to look kind of like you have to be high in the air. So yeah. I think these step-ups also, especially for events, like they don't really look that good. I remember like a couple of years later, the X Games started kind of, the, the, the bigger, the X Games bigger had this kind of jump. And I remember like you could barely not see anyone fly. They would be just like skimming over the knuckle, you know. And so I think the jump, the concept's still sort of around, but I think they've like people have improved it where it's like a mi a middle ground between that and like a normal jump mm -hmm. or something, right? Yeah, those Charles Beckinsale jumps seem really good for that where he's at with building those. And and when you when you went in that session where you're going 128 kilometers, you kept pancaking on the and then you guys rebuild it and you have this electric session. Now I'm curious about there was kind of a race for the front end double cork around this time. Right, like people and Travis did one in Pop, and you were you were doing them around that same time. Do, who did it first? Um, I mean, so yeah, JP Walker did the first double cork, yeah. no doubt. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's funny because I when it came out, I didn't really take that much notice because I thought it didn't look repeatable. 
because it looked more like a wakeboardish sideways flip a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, and it, but that was my thought back then. I looked at the sequence again not too long ago. I saw it. I'm like, that's fully legit, technically perfect double cork. I think just it didn't really process in my mind that you could do that. But so he, JP did the by like there's no discussion that he did it did that first. And then when I saw Travis's on Pyramid Gap, I thought that looked repeatable. Like that was the first where I was like, that makes total sense. He lands like perfect on his feet. Everything, you know, like the rotation kind of like evens out at the end. You're like, I saw that. I'm like, oh yeah, that that's a trick that will be repeatable. And then, um, yeah, I just I think I just tried to like go after that and emulate, like try to try to learn that. And I figured if I don't find the right power jump, then like that jump would enable me to try it. So that was the so that step over was the first one you did. <clears throat> Yeah, that's the first one I did. Okay, yeah, sick. yeah. And then you did. I remember seeing footage of you doing a front twelve. Was it double or flat? I don't remember. Probably double. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like I mean, it's like kind of like it's like a. I remember doing like a ten and then like a jank, like a little bit like the one eighty around. And yep. it's it's sometimes like when you know when people. I remember when somebody it's double cork came up and someone was like, "Yeah, you were a part of that evolution." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm sorry." <laughs> You know, because it's like, <laughs> you know, like I mean, now these days, it's like if somebody does a te- is a does a double cork, it looks like they're doing a three sixty. It's like super, like there are people who style them, do multiple grabs. Yeah. So, but I think a lot of times, like I was always like really into like, is that like like technical riding? Like, is that possible? You know, and and then and I wouldn't say like style came second, but sometimes it's like you push that avenue, and you're like. I just want to see if that works and then maybe in the next step I'll try to like kind of make it look a little better. So yeah, so that I think a lot of that was a little bit in that, yeah, maybe just trying to push it realm. You know, I really like your guys' hats today. Thank you, Jules. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, We're feeling very stylish and we got them from Autumn Headwear. Great company started by the boy Brad Albin. That's my guy. Yep. Great, great style. Great team. Uh, they have multiple styles of beanie. Oh, tell me. Yeah, including the surplus fit, wow. which is a uh, little bit deeper, a little bit more of a res. They got the shorty fit. If you're looking for more of that fisherman friendly rolled up style. Yeah, you got my attention now. Yeah, yeah, it's all silk all day. Yeah, and then they got true. the simple fit, which is something right in between that. Mm. Ah, just like Goldilocks, just right. Exactly. Yeah, thank you, Jules. So get on down to autumnheadwear.com and use code BOMBHOLE for 20% off. Get yourself right. Hop, you had a good question earlier when we were talking about your work, uh, about his inspirations. You want to tee that up? So, David, like, throughout your career, I'd say that creativity and progression are two things that have kind of either followed you or things that you've just kind of connected with. So that being said, like who are the riders, whether they were from the previous era or your era of snowboarding that you looked at for influence or for inspiration that you were influenced by? Um, Yeah, so there's a couple of riders, but it's like, so there's a couple of riders I was influenced by very strongly, but it's, I think it's funny. Like I could almost like name like one specific person for, for like, every couple of years, you know? Mm. And then they st- they stick, kind of, you know? So I think it started with, like, Craig Kelly, because I grew, I like, you know, started snowboarding, like, around 90, and he was the GOAT, you know? I mean, just by far the best, best style, own pro model. I saw you guys have the graphic out there. That's obviously the, re- the reprint, yeah. right? Yeah, I was like, re-print. wow. Yeah. But, the, I mean, that mystery air, like, the mystery air and then that board. So Craig Kelly was, like, my god for a couple couple years. And then Brushy took over for a second, and then Terrier. I think that was like the early, the early full full on like I mean Burton I think owned like that early freestyle phase in a little bit, and then, um, I mean to the point where like Terrier probably stuck for like ten years I'd say, and like me and pretty much all my friends like we would like go up on the hill, film each other like everybody would pretend like pick a character like I'm Terrier today, and like just try to emulate that and like even like the way we wore our goggles and stuff like, and you know how he would be like, it'd be like this thing where his goggles like super low and like, he's like, he's like this, you know, like the, the, the tongue, like you wouldn't, but I don't know. You, you think, I think as a kid, you're like obsessed about it and you, you it's, and I think that's so hilarious that, or so wonderful also that 
especially as a kid, you interpret so much um, like almost like mythical, like, I don't know, qualities or, or like, like this higher truth in these things. You see how somebody wears his clothes, straps in tweaks, and it's almost like there is, at least I, um, I believe there was like a, some kind of like secret code or something, like something you would be following, maybe you could tap into or, um, I don't know. So I think, um, yeah, like Terry was just like, that was a obsessive almost. Um, and then I think then that's a little more like maturing into like riding myself, like uh, contests or, or being maybe even just on the, on the verge of filming then like forum really kind of took over. Like I was like full on forum fanboy, like to, um, Peter, primarily Peter and JP, I'd say like Peter on the technical front and JP of just like pushing it and being just, I think, JP really molded like the modern day video part. Like I think I modeled also like my career to some extent. I modeled that after like the writing of JP and trying to be like, ooh, you know, you need a good backcountry shot, like a riding shot, you know, and then like also a good pipe, like still have a good pipe shot and everything. So that was, um, yeah, I think, and then JP, I think, and then I think once like, I'd say like JP was probably still like totally into the robot food era. I was like a total like JP fan. And then I think probably at that point, at some point we were like more amongst the people that we rode with that we were like kind of feeding off. And also we were a little disillusioned in a way, you know, cause like you, um, you grow up thinking that there's these like incredible truths and like you just climb like la the ladder towards like basically the forum camouflage pants that are in the clouds and you expect that there's a subcultural truth and you get to the top and just like Yoni Malmi <laughs> way, waiting there and he doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't really have a coup either, you know? And so you're like, like, oh, hold on. Like, <laughs> like nobody has a coup here. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Oh, it's yeah. Like, yeah. I think, like, I yeah. mean, it's like growing up, like, you find out everybody's winging You're it, like, you know? These like, guys are just like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and then, then I think that's, I mean, it's something that I struggle with today. So <clears> I don't know, <throat> how about you? But, like, I struggle with that today sometimes. That It's, like, really hard to get into a zone of, like, this, like, childish belief of being, like, something is, is really um, genius. Because for the most part, I think it's a lot of work. Uh, and people are always influenced by other people. There are very, very few, I think, really geniuses out there that have this like have this aura. And even if you get close, they still have it. You know, I think I think we just take a lot of comfort in thinking that these geniuses exist because how scary is it if nobody has a clue? You know, like that's super scary. Like as a world, you know, like that's I think also like everybody like welcomes these these people like Steve Jobs and Elon Musk because you're like, yeah, somebody knows what's going on. But like probably no one knows what the fuck's going on, you know, and then some people are significantly more intelligent, privileged, whatever they they do to to create these these realities. But I think, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to know, Chris, from your point, if you had that dis disillusionment, because for me, it was a little bit like, oh, wow. OK, holy shit. It's like it rearranged. But I think it's probably just, you know, growing up and kind of falling out of that, uh, that bubble. Yeah, no, I mean, I, definitely there is there's some magical fairy dust around pros growing up and meeting them. And even me sitting here talking to you today is is something that, I, like I said, when I was younger, I would be I would be shitting myself. And I think what I've what I've realized, maybe not from snowboarding, but from doing the podcast is these I've I put so many humans on a pedestal and you know I you know idolized them and and made them larger than life in my head and took in so much inspiration from them and luckily I've been able to sit down and have a lot of great conversations with people and the one thing I realized it's like what you said with Yoni Malmi and things like that it's like you you're sitting there talking to I'm sitting there talking to like Jamie Thomas or all these people that I just like I can't believe they're sitting here talking to me and then you by the end of the conversation you're like oh this, this fucking guy's just like me we're just yeah. like they're just normal normal person no, yeah. uh, normal person but I do think that going back to um what like in the video part era 
I think the fact that you couldn't see somebody what they had for breakfast. You didn't, there was more mystery. They, they, they were more untouchable. They were, they were, and again, the only avenues that you saw were photos in a magazine and their video parts. So the only thing that was displayed to you were these kind of unattainable pros that you didn't even know was possible. But I think nowadays with the fact that you see everything that that person does, it humanizes it humanizes the pros. It humanizes these people that we idolize more to where it is almost more attainable because you realize that they are just like you. And I think that's why the pros of, of your generation and previous to that are almost in a higher level of like uh, stardom because, you know, my 13 year old self or whatever is still, you know, has you in that box, you know, and, um, so I don't know. It's just interesting stuff to talk about. I think that's a really good point that, uh, that it, that we humanized generally, I think also through media oversaturation or, or saturation, let's just, I mean, doesn't have to be bad. Could be also humanization could be great, right? Like, I mean, why put people on pedestal? <clears throat> I mean, um, I, but I have the same, I have, I have the same feeling that I think maybe, Back then, when you had just a very limited amount of output, then it was easier to have an interpretation of what that is and everything. And just before, just before we move on, just to make make this clear, like I'm great fan of Malmi, like I love the guy, and like, just like just just um, you know, like and, and and like super good guy, amazing writer, and also like obviously he was part of that. I just said I just want to say because that's somebody I rode with. I never to me JP and Jeremy still have a little bit of that aura. Yep. And like because I filmed with Malmi, it's like like oh wow, he just what you said, he is just it's just a normal guy, just like me. And um I think that kind of like that breaks this the the potential for for idealiz idealization basically. Mm -hmm. right? I, I do think bit. it's possible for people to like be on that pedestal and you, for you to see them in this like with this surrounded by this mystique and with this superpower. And then also for that to dissolve when you like get to know those people or like get a closer look at them. But it's also possible for that to come back, for them to return to that pedestal mm -hmm. when you see them ride in person or when you see them do something. Yep. Like if it's a musician and you see them play on stage yeah. or whatever it is. And then you're just like, they have a fucking superpower. And then mm -hmm. like I can remember as a team manager, me being like, these fucking dipshits, these fucking people are driving me crazy. Then we'd go like to the spot or whatever, and I'd be like, these people are fucking superheroes. This is insanity. Then an hour mm -hmm. later, being like, these fucking assholes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in the car when you guys were just going crazy. <laughs> but like, that. but like it could it could yeah. go back and forth like that, where like I never lost I like I would never lose like the ability to see somebody with an, an incredible like a profound talent to identify the genius in that and see mm -hmm. the magic in that. But at the same time, to also see them as a human at different times that makes yeah. it like kind of goes back and forth. That's a little true. bit of a side no, side mission I, there. I, I love that. And you were just hanging out with this guy in um, Baldface. But the one person who is the ultimate misty person that you kind of idolize and then you meet them and you talk to them and you hang out with them in person and they somehow magnify 10x <laughs> is Jamie Lynn. Absolutely. Jamie Lynn yeah. is like yeah. that where you're yeah. like, every time he speaks, you just put him further and further up yeah. on the pedestal, yeah. right? Like, yeah. you ever hear him? Totally. I was telling you when I was up there, I was like, he was hanging in the bar and we, we, I think we know each other like by being at the same places a couple times, but barely. But barely. And I remember like, I'm, you know, sit down with him at the bar up there last week. And I'm like, I pretend to have like a normal conversation, but I'm really just like, just really have to hold it back that I'm just like, I can't take a photo. You know, I'm just like, you know I waited for the last day to like, I'm like waiting outside when he gets in the car. I'm like, can I take a photo? You know, like, and, but like, but you're totally right. Like I had the conversation with him and I was like, like, yeah, that guy is just incredible. Cause you feel like he is very unique as a, as a, as a, character and the way he's present and you're like wow he whatever his path was it put him in a in a place or maybe that maybe that was the unique aspect all along but that he's so incredibly present and you can just be yeah you can witness that right and this um that's true but so that but i think that's still then i think not the idealization i'm talking about is is always unrealistic it's always over the top like the way i looked at the forum guys was just like I mean, that was just nuts. Like, those were gods, you know? And then I think sitting with Jamie is now today, I'm thinking, 
that's a cool ass human being. It's mm -hmm. a really inspiring human being. And the way, and I'm like, also listening to his bomb hole, I was like, oh man, like I really want to go on like a trip like that. Like he was talking about motorbike trips where you don't know what's coming up, you know? Like the way we travel today is like, you know, how we, we, we book everything up front and we basically just try to match an expectation. And I think that we all know that expectations are terrible for being happy, you know, like any kind. And so I was like, oh, I listened to that. I'm like, man, that's really inspiring. But it's, a, it's still like at best in a really good day, it could be eye level, you know? But it's, it's, it's here a little above, but not like back then I was like, this is like, you know, they, if, they, if they said like, let's, I don't know, jump out the window, I'd be like, let's go. I'm, I'm ready to join the sect. And, you know, higher beliefs, just, I mean, they're great, but they, yeah, they, they also create a little bit of a problematic setting. Well, you're talking about doing spontaneous trips, and you were we were driving down from the canyon, and you're like, yeah, I uh, actually went on vacation to West Virginia, uh, which is like <laughs> a place uh, not known for people going on vacations to. Um, I'd love to elaborate why, as a German, you came to the United States and went to West Virginia for vacation. I think that's yeah. really funny. It was a little bit of a coincidence, but then also, like, I had I was in New York for a job. And I was staying at Kava's place with my girlfriend who uh, was shooting some stuff. Uh, she's a camera person. And, um, and then we had a week uh, or 10 days or something afterwards. And I always, you know, I spent so much time in the United States. And other than maybe like Anchorage, which I felt was kind of like out there, I'd only been to like these really like, I mean, I've of course, I've been to Idaho and stuff, but everything has been snowboard related, you know? And I thought like, oh, it'd be so nice to just kind of like um, just drive a little bit down south and, and, and catch that feel because I don't know it. And um, so there wasn't like a, a gigantic thought behind it. I told you I watched a documentary called Sherman's March, which is hilarious. Anyone, I mean, if you Google it, it's, it's great. Um, um, so yeah, I kind of wanted to travel a bit down there and also do a little bit of climbing. There's lots of climbing there, so. Oh, you're rock climbing. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Jesus. I know you're disappointed. <laughs> God, it's like it. funny because I'm like excited, yeah. and, and it's like I tell Chris, and like, it just sounds like he's like, yeah, God. Yeah, he tuned out already. Yeah, he tuned out. Like, the show is over. Show is over. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm old, man. I'm into running and rock climbing. Like, how uh, pathetic is that, oh, David? What happened? Yeah, yeah. It's like I go skateboarding, and like my back hurts for like what? for like <clears throat> two days the, so. thi the thing i find interesting is you comment so frequently on like how scary this was and how scary that was and you want to make things safer but then you're always doing all this like really gnarly shit like where is that line yeah that is for weird. you like you're like tiptoeing mm. on either mm. side of totally that, it seems that's like. because it's interesting like my uh my girlfriend who had been i've been going on for with her for five years now approximately she knows me fairly well i'd say and to her it's super bizarre that i had this other life where did dangerous things because she's like like you're you're a scared individual like, <laughs> like when we're talking about having kids she's like man i don't want this overprotective dad and she's like she's like thinking and it's interesting because like to some extent i feel like i totally randomly landed in snowboarding and i was really outside of my comfort zone most of the time um but now i seriously asked myself that question because I was like this summer I was for the first time climbing like a little like higher routes where you do multiple pitches and I was thinking like it's weird I kind of st still choose something that is a little bit it's still kind of kind of between like controlling that and controlling fear and kind of going close to it so there's something I'm totally tiptoeing that's true but I I think my yeah I think me as like a character I'm definitely like more on the safe side you know I, so, however, I think I think I got, I got to the root of it because I've realized this riding with David for one day of my life yesterday. He is a victim of peer pressure. You he's can, a victim. <laughs> period. <laughs> you can you can. He's a victim. Face closed. Comma. Yeah. He also you can peer pressure him really easily. Yeah. So like the one thing is like he was riding this thing and re, like he was you know, five seconds away from it. I was like, do a back three. And I'm like, <laughs> and he's, what does he do? He does a back three. And I think that that's, that could be there. Maybe there's something behind that of, cause that's the thing with snowboarding. We were talking about this in the way on the way up is, is that, you know, you, to be a pro snowboarder, it, it's like you're building a cheese wedge, right? You do a switchback rodeo nine on this jump, for example, right? It is way easier to be like, 
I can do a front three on this. I know I'm going to land. I know it's going to be in my comfort zone. But like the like winging yourself into the unknown is it's not like you're not scared. You just force yourself to do it. I think people like to say, oh, that person doesn't have fear. I always hear that. Oh, that person doesn't have fear. That person doesn't have fear. It's like, I, I don't think it's that you don't have fear. It's that you have fear and you work through it. Yeah, uh, probably. I mean, definitely. I think there hardly anyone doesn't have fear. Or any, I'm sure you've, you guys have witnessed that too. The people that have too little fear, I think they're hurt instantly and they're out of the game mostly because I think it's a, you know, it's a self-regulating mechanism. Mm -hmm to be scared. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, there, I think there are two sides to overcoming that fear and one, and I'm, this is like, I mean, this is like a, uh, this, the, the former pro snowboarder self-help group yep. at bomb hole. Right. Yep. So, and I think there's, I mean, I obviously have some kind of chip on my shoulder to like do this. That's so far outside of my comfort zone. Um, and at the same time, I think, maybe that aligns then with tapping into a talent. And I think if you tap into a talent, it sometimes usually draws you in more, you know? And I think, I think I had so much joy in like imagining a trick and then seeing if I could do it and all that. And I think that combined with like, just like proving it to myself and everybody, whatever that, like I've done long enough therapy to figure, try to figure that out. But like, I think, um, yeah, it's, I think it's just, I think those two things combined kind of create like the energy to go beyond something, you know, it's like, I think if, if people weren't like, um, trying to compensate for something, we'd probably, we probably wouldn't have like electric light, you know, I feel like half yeah. of, half of all of the world's progress comes from some kind of like, uh, complex, you know, right. And, and, and I, I kind of think like, well, who cares? It's kind of like embrace it and, and. Of course, if it becomes unhealthy, I think it's good to look into it. Um, but I think if it, for a certain period of time, also in like certain phases of your life, those things work really well. You know, I remember like I was kind of joking with somebody that I was going on the bomb hole and was saying like, it feels like you guys already had me on the bomb hole because Lucas was here. And I basically, I feel like I could just like, like subscribe to everything Lucas, Lucas said, you know, it's just that it works really well. Lucas Huffman to be Lucas clear. Huffman, yep. sorry. Sorry, continue. Yep. Yeah. And primarily what he said about like that, like that mind of trying to prove something and that like really trying to perform works very well in this type of environment where it's also about comp competitive performance to some extent. Doesn't necessarily work well in other avenues of your life, you know, whether it's relationships, whether it's learning something, you know, it's like, I feel like for the most part, you know, I grew into snowboarding um, and without really maturing, like, you know, like when we grow up, like I feel like growing up, you always have this like this desire to be like something like really, really great, you know? And then if you're lucky or unlucky, however you want to see it, you get into snowboarding or something you're good at and you totally prove it to yourself that, like, yeah, I'm fucking amazing, you know, or something like that. And then... I think it's really easy to take that and think that, ooh, I can apply that to anything, you know? You can apply the hard work to anything, but I think uh, it's really hard to be this, uh, be, have this competitive mindset and then switch it and, for instance, like, do something that's totally non-competitive and just learn. Like, it's really hard to apply that to that, you know? So I think, um, to your question, I think there's a weird mix of things that go into creating the possibility for one to go beyond fear, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I have, some, I have another th theory that I just <clears throat> was kicking around as you were talking uh, that is a f could be a factor, and I'd love to pick your brain on this, is that uh, I feel as though snowboarding in an unhealthy way or healthy, depending on how you look at it, it kind of, when you're in it and you're in the thick of it and you're filming, you're trying to film your best video part you've ever filmed or competing or whatever that is, there's a sense of purpose that goes along with that. Like this is, this is my purpose. Like if I land this switchback rodeo nine, you know, this is just one of the puzzle pieces. Totally. Like this is what I'm doing. And this is like, you have something to believe in. <laughs> if I can just land all these tricks and then I can get that video part that I've been picturing in my head. It, and, and I think that like man's quest for purpose, human's quest, not man's, but human's quest for purpose is like, 
a huge part. Like, it doesn't really matter what it is. Like, when you latch onto those things and they give you a reason to get out of bed in the morning, I think in some ways, whether even if it's a chip on your shoulder type of thing, it's it's keeps you keeps you going and it's great. Totally. I mean, I think it's the best. I mean, to some extent, it's the it's the best mode to be in to have to be that focused on something, right? Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, at least thinking back, like that was like some of the most fulfilling uh, times in my life, where it's like so just a singular focus, and and I think just like you said, un- like to the point where it's like becomes unhealthy, you know? And then I think it's, but it is a funny question. It's like, if I just land this switch back to Rodeo 9, like then, and the question is then what? Like you're worth, <laughs> you're wor- a worthy individual or something, you know what I mean? But it's funny, like there's, I think like, I don't know, I would seriously, if you're a really pr- uh, um, successful athlete, Maybe don't go to therapy yet. Yeah. You know, one hundred percent. Like one hundred percent. Just keep and nurture that fucking like <laughs> yeah. toxic angst. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really that anxiety. Just milk that anxiety mm-hmm. and then move on afterwards. Yeah. But I, I think, yeah, it's um, it doesn't have to be bad. I think, uh, yeah, it has to be kind of. But yeah, I think it's good to look at it because, I mean, if if you end up like jumping, I don't know, jumping off like a hundred foot cliff and just dying. Like, it's kind of dumb for, you know what I mean? It's, there's a limit. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of dumb, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so I was, talking to, I was talking to Chris Owens. He was telling me a very funny story about when you first came to the United States. Uh, not your, maybe you're not your first trip, but your first time to come film Backcountry. You were with Kristoff, and you guys didn't have any of, like, the gear you needed, like a snowmobile and truck and all that, and you basically in, like, one fell swoop, you, like, got all the things you needed to start filming. I'd love to hear you explain that. Um, yeah, I hated that, really. It's like, you know, you already fly over here. It's so expensive, everything. You buy all this. And then, and then it's like, you need a snowmobile and a trailer and a car. Are you kidding me? Like, those are, like, life purchases to me, you know? Like, yeah. I feel like... Um, but, yeah, at some point, I mean, I think we had to do those things because we were, like, at some point, like... Um, like people were so annoyed, like, like doubling and driving like the dumb euros around who don't even tip, you know, like, I mean, it's, and at some point you're like, all right, let's just do this. And then, um, and then I think, yeah, I don't know. Even I think we, I bought a, I bought like a Dodge Durango here in Utah or something. And then Jason McAllister was nice enough to like register it or something and, um, drove it around for a while and. How did you know, like, where to start with that? Did you have somebody saying, like, okay, you're going to need this, you're going to need this, you're going to need this? Or did you guys just kind of have to figure that all out? I mean, I, I feel like I was, like, with you guys, so to speak, right? Like, you, like not you too, but, like, that uh, community at large, so the people who were hanging out with her, like, you need a so-and-so sled or something. And then, yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it seems totally bizarre, I think, to having to purchase all these vehicles and stuff, you know? And then, like, yeah, we shipped those, all our stuff up to... We shipped snowmobiles up to Alaska and all this stuff. It was wild. Like, in terms of logistics, that I always think, like, that's crazy, man. You put so much effort into into then, like, getting, like, a two-and-a-half-second clip, <laughs> you know? So wild. I always went... That was, like, after I was done making snowboard uh, movies, I was like... It'd be kind of cool to make like a like a multi sport film, only about like the effort because it's so ridiculous and and uh, like it seems, seems so removed when you and it's really funny for me like like now being being kind of detached and coming back and seeing like how much how vibrant basically the community and, and and snowboard culture is and thinking like it's so cool, but it's just wild people are out there just like for weeks filming you know, even though I've done it like for years. Mm. it's yeah seems like a weird reality when you step out of it step back in all right the good times are stacking up with the 24 25 icon pass on sale starting march 14th drop in on 50 plus destinations springs lowest prices plus limited time savings on child passes and renewal discounts pro tip Buy now, ride now with immediate access up to nine mountains and a total of up to 16 by early April. From $259 adult, claim your pass to the good times today.
So before we walk away from the concept of uh, building jumps and shaping jumps and all that, was there ever anything that you conceptualized and really wanted to build or to ride that you never got the opportunity to? There actually was, yeah. Um, we, I think we might have sort of tried, but then abandoned it really quick. And I'm not sure if somebody did it, but it's, uh, but what we wanted, always wanted to do was create a, a basically like a quarter pipe, like hippish quarter pipe that has an endless landing next to it that goes up. So you could just launch up. You just launch as fast as you want. It doesn't matter. But basically, you it's like a transfer up into something or you land at the same height. But same, same basically the same concept having a quarter pipe that would, so you basically have like one takeoff and then have like a higher um, landing to the side of it. Cause we were thinking I'll be really interesting to try to like, you know, try to push like new pipe tricks or something and not deck or not land flat. That's something. And it, the problem is or was, I remember we um, with, I think Eric Rosen at North star he was up for trying it, but it's just, it. you need so much snow. You need like three pipes on top of each other. And then how do you, you can't really shape that. Yeah. But I think it would be really fun to hit because you could just like charge it and never land flat. Yeah, it kind of removes the potential for impact yeah. when you land. And so, especially if you don't pop, yeah, if you pop up high, you like under pop, then you can under land. Pop. Yeah. And imagine that was our thought. You also, you kind of, you don't have it like perfect vert. You just have it a little slightly. So you kind of travel a little out, but your out would be up into something, mm. which would be really, I mean, I'd be really psyched because we spoke about how scary, did we speak about how scary super pipes were? I don't think so. Oh, I spoke to someone, Mikey or someone, like I dropped in a super pipe like three weeks, uh, three years ago, but that, I think that's like the same, you know, the same, probably the same size they have at the Olympics. Super scary. Well, you're the first person to do a front mm. 10 double in the pipe, right? Sort of, but uh, you know what? To some extent, we did the mini miniature version of that. We had a yeah, pipe, on that pipe wall. cut wall yep. and then angled the, the landing back a little bit just to kind of, you know, kind of eliminate the knuckle. Mm. So that was like maybe the, the, the version, the, the small version to, to that. But yeah, um, it'd be nice to, that, that was something I was like, ah, oh, it's a bummer that we didn't get to build that. I love to see to hear the the German engineering mind always going like it's all you're always like I remember watching the video uh, where you're talking about the step over and you got like you know all kinds of charts going and different lines and there's though, math going there's like math happening it's, <laughs> it's all Christoph though oh Christoph okay. Christoph is the fucking uber nerd okay like. Yeah. Dude, he's so he like, makes you look like a junior bacon nerd. Christoph Weber. Christoph Weber Torsen, he is the ultimate super nerd. So he, you know, yeah, I think, I mean, I have to give him, uh, maybe that's a perfect spot to give him credit. Like, we were such a good team. You know, like, we were, I think we were, like, both so supportive of one another. And I don't know, like, I think a lot of people, a lot of, like, these duels find each other in filming or in, but, I mean, seriously, we, I, I think we kind of stuck together through all of robot food and everything afterwards we did. So we worked together super close for like, what is that? Five years? Like, like, you know, and, um, we were a really good team because I think, uh, maybe I was a little, I, I was certainly a little more prominent of a writer where I could have the pull and have people like support our projects. But I have to say a lot of the ideas also, like, especially in terms of jumps, um, came from him. And like, I mean, I can't really, I can't even like put together like an Ikea shelf. I'm, I'm useless, seriously. So it's pretty funny seeing like it's a German engineering mind. Cause I'm like, I'm the furthest from a German engineering mind that yeah. you could possibly have. Like, I'm just really, yeah. Yeah. I can recall he did some interesting things kind of pre GoPro with like POV cams that he was like literally like taping to his head and stuff like that. Dude, that was yeah. pretty cool. It's so dude, he was like you know, building these, like, I mean, he essentially built a selfie stick before the selfie stick bought, like, all these cameras. He would also also be the one that'd be, like, looking into the technical aspect of, let's get this camera with this lens and and try this. And then, um, I mean, we bought, like, a um, like an A-cam, like the small Super 16s and all this stuff. So, and then, I mean, he also then built his, like, airplanes, built drones by himself. And now, I mean, now he's probably one of the, most well-known drone f drone filmers on the planet, I'd say, like in sports, you know, like won a 
sports Emmy last year for the for the Marcus Eater skiing clip. I don't. Do you guys see that? Oh, no way. I didn't no. know. I didn't. Yeah, know. Christoph, I, I, I didn't even know he was what? doing that. That's yeah, crazy. Christoph, Christoph shot that, edited that, and conceptualized that with Marcus together. So that's fully. It's like his his thing. It's pretty dope. What a gangster. Yeah, he's he's such a cool cat. So shout out to Christoph and. Um, we still hang out as much as we can, but like, I mean, and his daughter is my godchild and stuff. So we, um, yeah, we hang out, but, but he, yeah, I mean, he lives in Innsbruck. I live in Munich. So occasionally, like, I'd say we probably only see each other like four, five times a year or something. But um, now I got to get to the bottom of this. A lot of the uh, Americans were talking about you guys, you know, you, you guys were a duo and you guys would be building a cheese wedge. And everybody would be sp- speaking English, and then you guys would be speaking German, <laughs> and everybody was convinced that you you guys were just talking shit about the Americans in German the entire time when you're with Christoph. What percent would you say? Maybe like forty five percent. I don't know, but it's pretty funny. I know that like I remember. Be honest. Be honest. <laughs> I remember there's one thing. I hope I'm sure there's no there's no video of that, but that was one of the funniest. Uh, moments I think ever snowboarding was we were in Alaska I think the first time everybody super gripped because it's Alaska you th- I mean it's it is dangerous but at the same time you're also gripped because it's Alaska and I remember he hi- he wanted to, he hiked some sketchy ridge wanted to drop in I was on the radio and we had always we always in the backcountry we had this um, rule that everybody had to speak English so everybody knew what we were talking about on the radio just for safety reasons right so like you walk in there like I don't know what the hell you know two Finns speak Finnish and two Germans speak German kind of sucks and um, (laughs) and Christoph was kind of like really gripped probably on a knife knife ridge or something and he was wearing like a balaclava face mask with like I don't even probably not even an air hole (laughs) <laughs> and I couldn't understand a single word he was saying on the radio, and I was like, I, I, I was just asking him again and again, and for some reason, probably because we were like a fucking couple for, you know, like that had been married for like five years, he thought in some like I was being just passive aggressive, and he started like yelling at me, and it, be, it ended up being like, then we switched from English to German to this like <laughs> full on like <laughs> fuck you, you fucking fuck like on the, and then in the end I think he came down like we're so pissed at each other. In the end he came down and like we watched his, his GoPro footage or like whatever camera he was on, you couldn't understand a single word he was saying like, <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, but he's like, um, yeah, it's wild, man. How much time we spent together? It's really cool. Like. Also, just you know, like if like it's crazy how much time you spent with like your fellow snowboarders, like on in the off time, like driving up to Alaska. You know, I think we did two drives up to Alaska, and I don't know, you probably drive like six straight days or something. You know, it's yeah. like it's through the middle of nowhere. Yeah, you better have some conversations. Yeah. Uh, I got a guest question from uh, a legend by the name of Pat Bridges. Here we go. Hey, David, it's uh, Pat Bridges checking in. Um, Hey, in addition to your writing, one thing that's always struck me about you is your wit and your sense of humor. I know we've talked about it before, but do you want to, you know, elaborate on why you think it is that not a lot of Germans are very funny or have a lot of humor? And why do you think you're unique in that way? Stoked to hear the answer. Always great to see you. Enjoy the bomb hall. Have a good one. (laughs) Love this. So this is going to be a real bummer for all my German friends, but it's obviously that I'm, if I'm funny, then I'm funny because I'm not German, but my parents are both Hungarian. Mm. Okay. Mm, yeah. That explains and, it. That, and that, that, we, that checks out. Yeah. yeah. That checks out. Yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry. But, and I mean, there is like, I, I think we spoke about this yesterday briefly, like there is like a, a proper like media science theory um, that like pretty much all of the German like movie talent and all comedians and everybody like Germany had like a lot of great film like early film and uh, comedy basically emigrated or got killed because it's, it's Jewish now we, we got them we got them in America yeah Seinfeld. now you got them in America yeah, yeah. we got all kinds true we got I mean it's a big we emigration like a lot of Larry the, David yeah we're killing yeah, it we're doing yeah we're doing yeah. good yeah so and if there's if you're interested in a deep dive you can check out the South Park episode uh highlighting that uh, yeah, German's not being funny. German's not being funny, and he's the the guy's desperately trying to uh, make funny jokes, and 
they're not landing. It's, <laughs> it's a great watch. It's a great watch. But no disrespect. No disrespect. Yeah, <laughs> no disrespect. Uh, all right. So uh, to any German listeners still tuning in, thank you. And uh, let's keep this thing moving. I mean, we didn't talk about your early days. So I think that would be cool to go back and rewind to, like, cause, cause, you know, we started at, at Robot Food in this podcast. So I'd love to know, like, I don't know anything about where you grew up yeah. and how you got into snowboarding and what that looks like. Um, yeah, so grew up in Munich in Germany. Um, have an older brother. Um, it's like, I think it's like very pretty typical, like late 80s skating, skateboarding, you know, like really becoming like something, you know, E.T., that whole bubble of American pop culture just like kind of just that we're like all that flooding Europe. Like we were, you know, it, that was I think that at least to me, that was really something that like uh, I found like super fascinating, like all that stuff coming, like, you know, also like. Michael J. Fox being pulled behind a car on a skateboard, like all that stuff, I think so. Um, and that sort of naturally led into, you know, we live close to the mountains, so we were skiing, and then my brother started snowboarding, and um, as a little brother does, I do everything, you know, same, try to emulate my, my older brother, and luckily he picked that. So, and then it was just a really cool, that's one thing that's pretty amazing. Like, so I'd say I got into, like, competing, but more like for fun because those were the only places that had snowboard parks, maybe like early 90s, like 92, 93. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. I think in the early 90s, you had probably a better and more well-structured like um, grassroots snowboards movement than now. Like we had like a local contest series, regional contest series, national contest series then an intermediate between like all like the Euro countries. So you'd be, so it was like, you could naturally just like have fun and climb the ranks kind of. And, and that's what we did without necessarily like, well, that's not true. I was going to say not, not really aiming for something, but I saw Craig Kelly like in 91 in a video. I'm like, that's what I want to do. So that's not true. I was pretty driven, but I think it was uh, still like a very natural, organic, um, kind of progress without even like much of a, you know, much of a thought that you needed to be super good, but it's just kind of slowly. And how old would you say you were when like your talent started kind of becoming apparent? Like, whereas like, I might have something here. This is, I'm pretty good at this. And also part two of that question yeah. is, was your brother a lot better than you in um, the beginning? And was, was there some sort of like, I've, I want to be better than my brother. Yeah. Because it kind of seems like there's a lot of brotherly relationships totally. in snowboarding where the younger brother often emerges as, like, in the long run, the better snowboarder. Yeah, I mean, like, it's funny because when I said early, like, I don't know what the chip on my shoulder is, you know, but, like, my best guess is, like, trying to impress my brother and then excel, you know, because mm -hmm. we have a very, like, we had a very strong relationship with a lot of friction, you know, like, but I think, and, and, uh, so I think following his path and then maybe to some extent, I think he was, he was always kind of trying to keep me away because he was old. He didn't want the young guy like sticking around his friends. And so I think for me, it's like trying to, you know, like follow him and, and kind of just be loved then becomes this full destructive force of being like, I'm going to be better. <laughs> you know what I totally, mean? Totally, yeah. So, so um, yeah, I'm sorry, Boris. But, um, yeah, so my brother was also a pro snowboarder. Um, and, I, like, like super talented, crazy, like, like all-terrain just charger. Like, I think he would have actually been, like, really, really, or, I mean, is, but would have become really uh, interesting big mountain rider. Because he has freestyle, but he's just... <clears throat> he's just gnarly. Like if I say I'm a f scared person, he's not at all. Like, or at least that's like, you know, I need, I need to like focus on technical writing to kind of make that safer. And he is just like charging. Um, and so I think, so he, yeah. And then he filmed like with, uh, with Kurt Heine and Hazeltine back in the day and then kind of drifted off a little bit more in like behind the camera filming some stuff. And then he, we worked together on 91 words too. 
And uh, in short too, right? Or in short too, yeah. Yeah, and the gap session. Gap network. session too, like all those yeah. things. We did those together, which also, I mean, brotherly relationships also, like sometimes it's Strong great, friction. sometimes it's just terrible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting how like when you know when you're so close with somebody, sometimes it's sometimes you feel like you have to, you you know like like put on like the uh, the satin gloves to like communicate something and sometimes it's like a fucking like bare fist in the face yeah it's so weird how and so um i'm kind of glad we don't work together anymore but um it's also cool that we experience so much together so mm -hmm. now a lot of people don't know too going back to your coming up and stuff i found out that i didn't know that you grew up riding half pipe yeah and competing in half pipe yeah so that that helps the junior what junior vice world champion 1999 Ooh. wow just telling wow. you Wow. Maybe like, like the most like yeah, the most the 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 result I was most impressive in my life cuz I was like cuz those I mean it was like so many good guys and just like weaseling through and and getting on a podium at that age you're like holy shit this is so big. How how old were you then? Like 18 or something? Well, actually yeah, I was uh, yeah, I was 18. You know what yeah. I noticed with all half pipe riders that are insane at jumping is that they all have the they they slow it down with the pop and then waiting to grab like the there's no pre-spin or an initiation like watch Arthur oh, Longo. Interesting. Yeah, if you watch Arthur Longo. He comes from a half pipe background. Yeah. It's like a very deliberate pop, and then the spin starts, and then he grabs. Totally. Where I think that like the the people that grow up riding jumps, you can kind of learn to like scrub it and grab early. And, True, that's a and bit. half pipe you got to be more deliberate. Yeah, I mean we also like we I think also back then we realized like ooh watching Terrier, like. He knows how to race. He knows how to use his edge, and that gives him such an advantage over everybody. So we, yeah. we even like Burton back then. I wrote for Burton. So I, so going back, like I, like being twelve, I just walked up to somebody at the edge of the half pipe wearing all Burton stuff, which was like you never saw that back then. It's like you have to work for the company. Nobody has that. And um, I just kind of asked him like, hey, what's going on with like promotion and stuff? Just like, <laughs> totally, like just a you know, 12 year old idiot. And he thought it was hilarious and gave me his, and gave me his business card. I don't think he even saw me ride. And we, then we put together a little booklet and stuff and sent it to them. And they gave us like, you know, board, like, like, like a rental board for the season. But to us, it was like, we're on the Burton team. Like me and my best, best buddy, we, like the next day, we went to the train station or like the subway where, you have, where they have these business card machines. And we made a business card that says Burton Team and his name and my name. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Like 12 years old, just walking around handing out business Take cards. Take my card. Like, like, who would you hand that out to, too? You know, it's like, no, like, it I'm was, on the team. I'm like, just my, praying there's some 12-year-old yeah. girls that are like, excuse me, do you have a business card by any strange chance? <laughs> Dude, and it's like my one of my oldest friends. He's so pissed today, even that we went to these like summer camps, and I would roll up. <laughs> that's it. He claims I'm not sure if that better. We roll. We would roll up, and I'd be like, "Hi, I'm David. I'm sponsored by Burton." <laughs> 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 just, kinda, just kind of being like, just trying to like bypass any social like work you have to do to become like like. Just be like, I have a T-shirt. I got it for free. <laughs> See this, you know. <laughs> The random guy at the bus stop. Hey, this T-shirt I'm wearing. Somebody gave it. I know you didn't ask. Yeah. I know you didn't yeah. ask, but yeah. you must be dying to know. I did not pay for this. <laughs> but um, and then I think I mean it was total coincidence. I think they really random us randomly. I mean early '90s, anyone got a free board basically, and I think it was kind of coincidence that they handed us those boards, and then we both, me and Minnie, that's like my oldest and best friend still. Um, we both like um, kind of like kept doing it, and he he also ended up filming for for Absinthe and was on the Burton Euro uh, Euro team and stuff. So we kind of kept kept doing that, but started out with a rental board, I think, that we got hmm. worked out. All right, Silk. You know uh, you know what time of the show it is. Uh, I think it might be time for name that video part. Okay, David, how are you feeling? Pretty uh, unconfident. Unconfident. Zero through ten. You got a you got a number. Four. Four. That's pretty good. 
Okay. Oh, shit. Reasonable amount of credibility at stake here. Yeah. This is big for you, David. Yeah, my, my younger self would be embarrassed because I think, yeah. Well, it's, it hasn't let's happened. See, let's, yeah. let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. I'm it just saying. I'm just jump in the gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm All just right. going to say Pierre Wickberg suggested this. So um, if you don't know it, take it up with him. Here we go. Yeah, that's uh, JP in Simple Pleasures. Woo! Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. wow. wow. Yeah. You came yep. through. Well done. Yeah, that was good. That was oh, good. that's cool that he, he suggested it. He said, uh, yeah, he thought you might know it. And uh, you won yourself, uh, you earned that bomb hole. No way. You got a tote back there. It's, uh, it's a bit of a rust color, Yeti tote, carry-all they call yeah. it. And it's uh, filled with bomb hole merch. I think there's some smelling salts in there. Radical. Maybe yeah. a hat. Cool, you can thanks. tell you can tell people on your flight you got that stuff for free. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> no, no, a I'll, I'll business card. I'll print a business card on the way to the airport tomorrow. <laughs> bomb hole guest. Team, yeah. No, no, bomb hole team. Like, yeah. yep, team writer. You will you will run into people like six months from now. Be like, hey, I met this guy. Who works for you. <laughs> <laughs> Legendary. All right, for uh, part two, this is for the listeners. If you guys know this song, comment on the photo of David on Instagram when the episode comes out. That's where we pick our winner. We need um, video and segment and Godspeed. Okay, thank you guys for you know playing. That one, David? Name I, that video. I don't part. think so. Yeah, it was a meatball. But, uh, <laughs> You know, David, I got to ask, thinking about, you know, you came from snowboarding, you're deeply embedded in it for a long time. You took a step back, so to speak. And now that you're, now that you're back and no pun intended with your book, but how do you view the current state of snowboarding now that you've stepped away for a little bit? What's your thoughts on the, the state of it? Um, I, I don't think I have an answer cause I don't have the data, but, mm. you know, like, or I don't have, I'm not in touch enough to allow myself an answer to that I, I, from the from the little bit of Instagram sort of um, on the periphery that I catch I would think I catch if something like amazing happens or something then I because I follow like if I see something something interesting I'm like oh wow that's that looks interesting and then like I you know as soon as I saw Blake Paul ride or Dusty Henriksen or something and something new comes up I'm like oh well, that's interesting and I'll, I'll follow that so but yeah that you know, that still can mean that I miss like 90% of it. So I, I wouldn't know. Um, but I think the one question I had for myself, I think when I, uh, made the book was like, like, wow, what's, you know, what's happening to snowboarding's culture. Right. And I think while I was making the book, it kind of, like I answered that question in the sense that, um, like the people that even if they come from like a really competitive background and that was maybe my main worry that like Olympics, coaches, all that stuff ramping up would sort of leave a really, really big imprint on the more cultural aspect of snowboarding. I would say that we are all, we all subscribe to far more, you know, videos, all that stuff. And, and, but then I think, I realized like, wait, hold on a second. A lot of people who actually come in through a lot more competitive avenue and even being coached and maybe even like, you know, Danny Davis used to do like football before snowboarding and stuff. Yeah. Snowboarding <clears throat> changes you, you know? And I think um, like that may be a little bit of an unsupervised environment coupled with like, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of autonomy and, and, a very visual culture. I think it it kind of, you know, like it sucks people in. So you can start as being like this, like totally jockey competitor. If you do it long enough, I, th I think most of the, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of people then kind of subscribe to, to the culture in like a second step. So mm. I, I would say I don't know what the state is today, of course, but I'm pretty confident it's quite healthy. Might be smaller, most certainly is. But that core, I would say, is very seems very healthy when I go out and ride Brighton with you guys. I'm like, wow, there's so many people that are just like really excited about it, and there's 
different avenues, you know. It's a, a little bit like skateboarding. We think like probably street league and all that stuff is bigger than ever in terms of just mainstream appeal, but that core culture is still as healthy as ever. So I, I'm not too worried. At the same time, I'm, I don't know. Mm. Well, that makes me also wonder too, you, you took a kind of, to me, what seemed to be a deliberate step back and we can go back into snowboarding and stuff, but while yeah. we're talking yeah. about it, I think it's on subject. You took it like you were, you were, you know, you were kind of in your prime and you mentioned earlier, past the torch. Um, what was the reasoning for just for taking a step back? Um, I think I felt to some extent that I had seen, I like a lot of stuff was repeating itself, I think. You know, I mean, snowboarding per se is like so cyclical with the seasons and stuff and you end up hitting the same spots already, which is crazy, but like already doing lame after after bang. So just a second robot film and I would go on like afterwards to do like five more films or whatever. Mm. Like already during lame, I was like, we kind of did the same thing last year. We, now we're doing a little more polished, but we're doing the same thing. And so um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I remember like, oh, I started getting more and more interested in like, oh, maybe I'm more interested in, you know, maybe editing also a little bit or also making a film or, you know, doing something that, um, that kind of changes that up a little bit. And so I think that just kind of progressed from year to year um, to the point where I was like um, during, I think during already making like in short, I think I had already like negotiated like my contract to be like, I can do whatever I want. You don't really have to, you know, like cut my salary in half every year and just let me kind of just do whatever I want. Yeah. So I, there wasn't, I think there was just like trying to, it just felt right to, to, to not have to perform athletically. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the other thing to add to that too, cause we didn't really dive into it, but even starting with robot food, all the design of like the DVD boxes and all the little details you were, you were really getting into design and editing starting like with after bang, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, that was also super lucky, right? Like robot food had its office in Nemo designs office yeah. space in Portland. And so I would go there in the summer originally only to edit my video part or my edit. I mean, I would sit behind Jess and Pierre while they edit. So I was, you know, nothing, uh, like, specifically creatively and then but I think maybe already by that time I had like already designed my pro model like super amateurish but anyway I was like really into graphic design like and um and then I was like there all summer in a design office with people who I could ask or show me things while I tried to come up with these you know like the DVD design and like all that stuff um so that was like almost a three-year internship, summer internship I did at Nemo Design. Shout out to Trevor Graves and Jeff Bartel and everybody there. Um, and that was a f fucking awesome time, you know, like lived at Kale Gray. Shout out to Kale Gray too. Cause like, I mean, he also like, I mean, I was crashing at his place like for months, like really for months in Portland. And, um, but that was like, that was really cool. You know, I could, I could be there, kind of see what they do learn from them so that that was kind of like a really cool easy intro into doing a little bit of design work yeah i mean not really a better place if you have kind of like a creative curiosity to be surrounded by guys like trevor graves and kind of that nemo office in portland that's like the totally. ideal situation yeah now so going back to the chronological order too so then you did so it was robot food 91 gap session in short and then it seems like current state of snowboarding, the book followed that shortly after. <sighs> three, I think three years three after. Years yeah, after. Okay. took three years to yeah. make that book. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, what was <laughs> what was going through your mind when you're like, I'm gonna write a a book called the current state of snowboarding? I think it, I think there were two elements to it. The one was like trying to answer that question, like, am I growing out of snowboarding? You know, mm -hmm. there's like weird. There's also something like like a little bit of an ad identity thing, and I'm. Like that, like that's a personal thing. That's one thing. Then there's like a, let's call it structural thing or snowboard historical thing is that at that time there weren't snowboarders who were above, I'd say 30 or not. I mean, there were maybe a handful, but splitboarding would just like splitboarding, power surfing, all that would, was to come kind of, or was just in the infant stages. So I felt like, oh, wow, it's kind of crazy. Like, 
am I already exiting this thing that I love because there's no like place for me in this a little bit, right? And I remember I spoke to Emmanuel Krebs back then. And he was like, yeah, I want to, I spoke to him about before the book. So Emmanuel was also a Solomon team manager and like a good friend. And, and he had exited snowboarding and I asked him like, isn't that weird? And he's like, yeah, he doesn't really get it because like after a certain amount of time, like snowboarding just becomes your personal thing. But I wouldn't want to accept that. I was like, no, there should be something I can identify with, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's weird because like, he's totally right, you know. It's it is it should should and everything is and should be a personal joy, you know. You know but I, it's kind of fun and like to hold on to something and feel like you're part of something. So it's a lot easier seeing like if you know power surfing. I think so now with Jones and also with the power surfers and with. Also, I mean, uh, you know, Jamie Gooch, those guys haven't been around. There is suddenly this thing where I'm like, I'm on the mountain today and I feel I'm part of something and I don't even have to be up to date, you know? I'm like, mm. I can still be associated with that and um, and not just be like a random weekend rider. I can still be like, hey, there's a little bit of a culture thing. So um, I think that was like the question I had for the book. and. Yeah. Um, I think that was a really valid question at that time because, totally. because that wasn't really existing, you know, like a longer term trajectory for a pro rider yeah. at the time. Yeah. And now, also now, for now an amateur. Quite different. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and even for an amateur. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you were to ask yourself, so now that their, their pros are staying in longer, it seems like, especially from the early days where they'd be done at like 20 or whatever, because it was such a young sport. But now you look at, you know, you and Dirksen are, are side by side. He never, he never took a stepped out of it, you know? Yeah. And if you were to go back in time, would you have kept one foot in the game a little bit longer? Yeah, that's a good question. Not really. Like, I don't feel like that would, would have been my way. Yep. But at the same time, I'm a little jealous too. Cause I mean, I would love to be just like, you know, like a mountaineering, like, ambassador wrapped in a culture and just being more in touch like but it's also I don't know if like I always felt like I had to get away from it for a little bit to come back you know mm -hmm. because it was so it was so much and so intense and so I was so fanatical about it yeah that I felt like like I wanted to kind of like break off and venture out and do something new and then and seriously, only until maybe like a year ago, I feel almost like, I feel like, oh, you know, I found a new home or I, I, I feel like in myself more than anywhere that yeah. I'm like, I can come back to snowboarding and be like really excited. Like I, you know, spoke about like being up at ball face and just being just, you know, really in love with the culture and like all that Um but, and then be able to enjoy it and not feel like it, it like holds me back. I'm like, I'm still an old, you know, like I'm a, I'm a former snowboarder. Like I have this joke with friends of mine that I was introduced at a party once and this friend was like, Hey, you got to meet David. Um, he used to be someone <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that became like a running joke. So every time I'm, and it's funny because he was, he was serious about it. You know, he just like kind of, kind of slipped out and I was like, but it is a like perfect thing. Right. You're like, I, you used to be someone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, shit. What happened? <laughs> you know, so it's like, what happened? I'm, and what, what's now? Am I not someone? So it's like, I think that whole, you know, it's like, I think maybe it's like good to feel your new you. And then being able to like kind of like also embrace that older thing, you know, like, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you spoke earlier about uh, like how you with the obsession of snowboarding, how you have this like it's almost simplified in a way because you have this singular focus. That yeah. You're just like really obsessive about. And when you are pursuing something else later or after snowboarding or something, anything else in the world, it's almost a matter of the real trick to being able to reproduce that is finding that thing that you're capable of being that obsessive about. Yeah. Do you feel like that you found that thing through any of the pursuits, whether it's film or design or directing or any of the things that you've got your hands on um, that you've been able to kind of like go all in in that same way where it maybe doesn't feel like work sometimes because you're so pursuant of it? 
That's a good question. Like it's happened occasionally on like certain projects, but I don't think I've found that. And I don't think I ever will just for the, uh, for the sake that what snowboarding was is like, I'm 14 years old. I'm obsessed. Yeah. And that is the ramp in which you launch and then it becomes something. But I think that obsession is also something that maybe we'll never, um, you only get once. You'll only get once. And, and I, I said this earlier already to, um, uh, when actually Matt Barr interviewed me like a couple of years ago, that my best friend, Minnie, we were talking about this, how like when you get older, some, a lot of stuff could, can seem dull sometimes, right? It's hard to get that high that you have as a kid, which is totally fine. I think it's just like learning to live with that. And we were talking about it. And, and my friend said like, um, when we were at the first competition ever, there was a Burton booth that had next year's Burton um, product which was something that we had never seen because we'd never been to a trade show. So it'd be like you enter this like little, it's a shitty fucking tent on a mountain, but we entered and it was like, this is from the future. And so we entered and there was like, I remember there was a, do you guys remember the two-tongue boot? Yeah, I do, totally. Burton, dude, you got to check it out, dude. It's sick. It's a, it was a boot that had laces on both lateral sides for tweaking. And it was, I remember it, it's, it was the second years. It was a uh, wild leather and red tongues. And I remember we were like, it was almost like an erotic thing. Like you had it in your hands. You're like, this is fucking insane. And I, we spoke about this and my, <laughs> my friend said like, yeah, he's been, he was trying to think about what comes close. And he was like, maybe the, maybe the birth of my son, like in terms of, like, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of intensity, yeah. <laughs> in terms of intensity, you know, yeah. and that is, I think that's something that also you have to be like, really, it took me a while though to figure out that maybe that high also the high, like that leads into like landing a crazy trick you're scared of. Like that high is not really attainable in other things. I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I would think you kind of, you do this and you have to kind of land and deal with like what's in front of you in this fucking bland world that is adult life, you know? Yeah. I, I think the high might be hard to replicate, but I think that there's potential for obsession and yeah, interests that can capture you in similar totally. ways and things like totally. that. But that you think similar way though, similar intensity, uh, similar but different. Similar you but know, different. Like, yeah, like the same amount of capture, but maybe yeah. not as intense. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe I'm just telling this to me so I'm not depressed because I'm like, <laughs> this is life. It's great. Yeah. Doing 100%. fantastic. Hundred <laughs> percent. But I do. I think that there's also. I'm gonna. I'm gonna fucking peel back the layers let's dive in a little deeper on this get in there i think that there's also a degree when you're a child or whatever depending on like when you get a level of obsession and purpose and you really are just fascinated it, it it almost can be likened as like sometimes maybe it could be a method for almost survival in a way like as in the human experience like i don't mean that in a life or death scenario but like something to like pull you out of a hole to give you something to look forward to totally. to like mm. this is like and you you haven't lived enough life to realize that that you can just be okay but in, yeah. t- until you figure that out the the trick the you know the new boot the the what if this happens is like a, a means to uh, I almost think on a deeper purpose, give you, give you, give you purpose. Like I said earlier. And then as you evolve and you do all these things, you're like, wait, I just landed the trick I've been dreaming of my whole life. I just climbed to the top of the ladder. I'm still, now let's look under a couple other rocks. Let's see, totally. let's see what else there is. But I think that it is at that point in your life when you, it's everything, then it's more, it's, and I know you're saying it's unhealthy, but it kind of is healthy in that time point. 100% healthy. Yeah. Like, I think I would love when I have, if I have kids, which I don't yet, um, I would be so thrilled for them to find something to latch onto. Because I know, yeah. seriously, I've enjoyed it so much to just, to be able to wrap yourself in something yeah. and like commit yourself. Go all the way. And there is, yeah. as you said, there's a purpose and there's a, and suddenly like falling down is just like one thing in a row of things. It's not like the end of the thing. So, and so I do think there's also like some incredibly positive um, experiences coming out of being an athlete or whatever snowboarders are it, like learning. I think the, the, the 
primary thing I, I would say I learned is like that you could theoretically do a lot more than you think you're capable of and, and you just have to kind of be persistent and stuff and push and through. Push through. And I think, and then a lot of people, I, I think I mean, there's a lot of successful people who go on to do other things. I think they, they just apply that. They apply that and they're, they're persistent mm -hmm. because I mean, um, Did we speak about discipline or no, Mikey, Mike, so I'm staying with Michael Blanc right now. And he's really, you know, he's talking about that discipline, how important discipline is. And I mean, he does a lot of Zen, uh, practices Zen Buddhism and everything. And so he's, but I agree in the sense that I think if you are, if you have, if you have somehow, and I think through snowboarding, maybe luckily I've learned that discipline because it was so joyful that you can kind of like, then you can stay in the grind, you know, like, and be like, Like it wasn't fun making a snowboard book for three years. I was like locking myself in an office, feeling I was completely incompetent, trying to achieve something that was at the same level in design that I was snowboarding at without zero experience or skill. Idiotic, you know, like really dumb. But at the same time, like it's like that's if you just stay at it and then, yeah, you realize it's like maybe that's not what it is, what yep. you achieve, but it's like you get – you. You know, there, there's something that, like, I don't know. It's, but, you but become it, resilient, I guess. But at the same time, when you were a kid, seeing Craig Kelly for the first time and thinking, I want to be that, it's kind of equally idiotic in the same way. Where it it's totally like, is. It's like kind of oblivious, like, yeah. I want to do that. And it's okay. like, dude, you have no idea yeah. what it takes to do that. But you just, you want it, so you totally. do it. Like when you did your book, it was your first time doing a book. But, exactly. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you won, like, Blue Dot Design Award and, like, a lot of accolades around this book. Like, this wasn't, like, a... A book you did in passing, like there, it was yeah, yeah, recognized totally. as like quite an achievement. Yeah, I mean, it goes. I think all that that said is like the amount of pain I'm. I was like ready to bear. You know, I was like fucking this. You know, you like you do this. It sucks. You kind of redo it. It's a little better. You do it again. It's a little. And if you just if you're harsh enough on yourself, and I'm not sure if that's necessarily a good modus operandi to work on because I mean it's not very fun. And I was like seriously depressed afterwards. Just like, I was like, this is fucking sucks, you know? And then like, but I think it, it just shows that it's theoretically, it's like it, what's possible. And then maybe there's a good middle ground to find that you can create something that's maybe mediocre and that doesn't say anything about yourself. Yeah. It, you're still fine. Mm -hmm. And I think that is maybe like, I'm probably not there because I still stress out about like, is this good or is this not good? But essentially, I mean, I'm certainly a little further down down that line, but I think that would be, I think, the destination for most of us to be happy, right? Be like, accept that but mediocrity is okay. And mediocrity can also be like a certain uh, like like interim state that you're in, whatever that means, like yeah. mediocrity. But I do think that that audacity to say, like, I've never made a book before. I'm going to just go all in on this and drive myself crazy and make something I'm really proud of. <laughs> It's that mentality that ultimately then leads to things like, I know you recently like did the rebrand for Solomon, which is like a, a massive undertaking. And I think that there's like a whole line of questioning around that as it pertains to design that I'd like to discuss. But I think, you know, it's almost that obliviousness that's like, I want to do that and I think I can do it well. Totally. When at the time of that thought, you're like completely not qualified or... Like there's no evidence that you would be able to do that. You just think mm. you might want to do it. And I think that the, those are kind of powerful thoughts to push yeah. through when you have them if you want to follow something. 100%. And I guess b before we get into the Solomon logo too, I mean, think about the opposite of that. Think about the opposite of like, I almost, I almost think of it as like indifference. Like you're just indifferent. Like you're just kind of floating. And Can I so th uh, throw something out yeah, real quick? Go ahead. I randomly ran across this quote and I took a photo and I was like, wow, this isn't great. And it was, um, the opposite of life is not death. It's indifference. No and way. I was like, yeah. holy wow. shit. Like, and that hit me really hard because I am indifferent on many levels to certain things, trying to shield myself. I'm like, oh, this is not important. This is not important because if they become important, you're kind of fucked, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Cause then like something, those, those things have power over you then. So, but I think that's so true. It's like fucking Uh, it's like the opposite is indifference. And that is, and I'm, I'm sometimes like, I'm so humbled by the fact that like how incredibly privileged we are that we stumbled upon something that we were not indifferent about. And I'm like, like it really, really fucks me up to think that there are kids that don't get that. Yes, you know? that's, yeah. 
That's a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent my point too. Is like we're talking about the to the toxic parts of absolutely throwing yourself into your work and like fucking putting everything you have into something and they're what behind that and whatever. But indifference of not caring about anything is like exactly you said the worst. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, one thing that stuck with me One we've had uh, Trevor Andrew on here, you know, and he has had an insane snowboard career, music career, art career. I look at yourself, you've, you know, snowboard career, design career, wrote a book, like you've so many things, film, filmmaking, like you, very, impressive, you know, accolades, so to speak. But I remember Trevor was just, I kind of asked him for some advice while I had a brilliant mind sitting next to me. And he's like, whatever it is that you do, that you lose yourself in your work, like wherever you lose track of time doing something, go towards that. And I think that that's such a great mantra in how to live a good life, whether it's fuck, like sometimes it's like little shit. I'm organizing my garage right now and I'm loving it. I'm like, where am I going to put, where am I going to put my, my open-ended wrenches? How am I going to hang them on the wall? And I'm and I'm realizing I'm losing myself in my garage organization right now. And I'm like thinking, you know what? Trevor Andrews, you know, he told me to go towards it. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to fall, like I'm going to lose sense track of time organizing my tools. And so, but I think about nowadays with like, you know, the, the toxic social media pulling you out of, you can live in a completely unconscious life oh, yeah. where you're indifferent to everything just, and you're just taking up space. And kind of living life passively and just yeah. kind of letting life happen to you instead of the other way around a little bit. Wise words. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Like, I think it's funny that I actually wrote that, wrote like not exactly that, but something down from Trevor's uh, bomb hole. Cause I thought like one thing, and it kind of goes in the same direction is that not only what pulls you, but also then I think what he's so strong is, is creating his own reality, like not, not giving a shit about what people think. Oh yeah. You know, and that is something it's funny that, cause I mean, I don't know if you viewers don't see it, but you guys have this, uh, sticker that says, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. So this is you guys trying to like make people obviously kind of remember that it's not about being liked on here. It's about kind of being authentic or whatever. And, and I like hearing Trevor say that. And I'm, cause I am, I'm a such a people pleaser. It's yeah. fucking ridiculous. I'm, dude, I'm, <laughs> hence the back three, hence the back three to grenade. <laughs> dude, I'm like, I'm seriously like, it's just, it's pathetic. Like, I'm not even real. I'm just reflection, dude. <laughs> seriously. Like, if you think this is great, it's because I read your minds and I model myself in the booth to be this fucking dumbass that sits here and is like really thoughtful or whatever, you know, like, fuck that. No, but I mean, there's some, <laughs> to some extent that's true, but at, at least I'm like, that's like a great challenge for me and like hearing, something like that from, uh, from Trevor because Trevor was always a little far out and like kind of polarizing, pushing it. Mm. And to me, I have like almost like a, it's a really weird, like it's a fantasy, but also like, I'm like try to stay away from it at the same time, you know, cause I'm like, you might like, you know, pl not please everybody. But then, you know, I think that's also such a good, and when you, you know, talk about social media, it's like, that is the common, like, like the thing that basically looks from the outside onto you and you see like the normative powers that you try to adhere to. And that, lo I mean, it's so hard to lose yourself when you look at what other people find attractive, like how hard, I mean, mm. and, and I'm, I think, I mean, that's basically sociology in a nutshell. What other people find attractive is what we deem attractive. It's so, we are social beings, no fucking way we can just be like, ah, you know what, everybody likes this, I like that. You will find your crowd that would like that and then you're in that. But I think it's, yeah, it's a major challenge. And I think as parents, like, you know, like looking at Hava, just as the only parent here in the, in the, in the right? Yeah, of course. Still unbelievable, yep. but yeah. Still unbelievable. Um, who has an awesome daughter, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great parenting. Um, yeah, that it's like, I think you just have to kind of like expose them to as much different stuff as possible. And then hopefully they, they find that one thing that like they're able to like yeah. tumble into head first and be like, ooh, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, I kind of want to erase the belief that you only get it once that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Like <laughs> it does totally like, yeah, I would love, I'm still chasing that totally. Mm -hmm. But... I think maybe also because I know like 
chasing that is an extremely unpleasant state of mind. I remember like, so I seriously, like I got in somewhat deep depression after, after the book actually, like kind of like after snowboarding, after the book, started film school, like film school and book overlapped like for the last six months. So I was like going to film school during the day and designing at night, just being like a maniac, just totally, just like, yeah. you know, having like suddenly like hearing like, um, like a tinnitus or whatever, what do you call it? Like the tinnitus. Tini- yeah, yeah, like yeah. tinnitus or yeah, tinnitus. T- yeah, tinnitus, sorry. I remember one of the coolest things that my therapist said, he's like, um, if you imagine like, like if you want some like interest to like slowly grow, you know, you can't just like plow that entire time, you know, you can plow the field and expect something to grow. Like I was just like manically trying to find that next thing, mm-hmm. but you kind of have to mm-hmm. sit back and be like, let's see if something grows. And that is like, what are you being pulled yeah. into? Yeah. Like not like, what is it that you don't have to push, but that you can, that pulls you. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've, I don't want to like exclude the option that maybe that there's a second, there's a second something that has that power. But I think I want to like almost shield myself from the hope because like I've, I'm like cool with that. It's like a little more dull, but I'm still sort of interested in, in a bunch of things. Mm. Well, the, the thing too, also we talk about too, it's like, when you're filming those video parts and you're in that, your, your highs are really high, but a lot of times there's, you're, if you're to look at your, your emotions on a scale, it's like very volatile, right? Where your, your highs are high. Oh, I fucking got beat up. I, I'm kind of down here. I haven't got a clip in two weeks and I'm down in the dumps. It's like this. And, and I think as, as you get older, like Mikey's a big Zen culture guy and like the meat, they talk about the medium way. Like mm-hmm. you, you don't want to be too, you know, a good balanced life is good. And I think as you get older, a balanced life is okay. You know, you don't need to summit Everest. It's like, can you, can you get great enjoyment from walking around the park with your dog? You know, and, and that's mm-hmm. like, are, are, you, are you happier? Like I, I've, I've seen friends do a trick that you can't even fucking fathom, but they're so pissed that they didn't grab for a half a second longer that they're actually mm. angry and then you but then you can find pleasure in simple things and i think that's also okay too yeah and i think you guys may find that you know should there come a day that you guys ever have children like that is kind of like a it's not like round 2 but it's kind of like a it's not a different chapter it's like it's a whole new book that is kind of its own new journey and whether it's children or like some new career or something else like I don't know. I think that there's like more than one act in the in the road trip. And maybe you if know. you're really, really lucky, then that amounts to seeing the Burton two tongue boot for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or becoming yeah. a professional garage organizer. Yeah. Or David films another video part. I'm just saying, are we, is that true. something, can I mean, we kick that around at all, David? Sure. I mean, I, I believe we have a Patreon question. We, yeah. yeah, we have from a question from uh, Charles Nuccio. says, now that you've had some time away from pro snowboarding, would you ever consider filming another video part? <laughs> um, I mean, what is a video part? You know, that's maybe a... That's up of, to you. Yeah. I think. So, Chris filming me on a backside 360, that would work. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I wouldn't like. I think putting the time in and actually kind of um, not, um, yeah, like not being able to ride the days that I'm out, but focus on filming. I think that's the major thing. Because if you think about it, like when we, f- we film or used to film, like you don't snowboard that much. Yep. It's like you strap your snowboard in for like a fraction of the day. And I remember the first time, like, after pro snowboarding, I was like, wow, there's a lot of snowboarding, you know? <laughs> you do a lot of snowboarding. I'm tired after these days now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever think about how bizarre that is? I was, like, I forget where the hell I was earlier this winter, but, yeah, you is in the backcountry, and you're like, all right, you, like, get the Airbnb, and then you, like you know, wake up early and then you got to like snowmobile forever on down the trail. And then you, you know, you break trail and then you like build this pat down and then you've been out there for like six hours or whatever, six hours. 
and and you haven't snowboarded in like three days because you've been traveling, <laughs> and then like your first time strapping in, you haven't like turned or like warmed up, and you're just flying off of a wedge, and you're just like, <laughs> it's just like kind of a bizarre, you know, it's super bizarre. It's like yeah. and go, like uh, go do something impressive. And the best thing is, yeah, do something impressive. And if you're like thinking about like 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 you know like Peter Lyon or something, like people really pushing like pioneering things, you're like that strapping in is like, and now you do something that's never been done before. It's like, wh- what the <laughs> yeah. fuck, you know? It's so, it's, yeah, it's wild. It's really, I think once you get behind like kind of pro snowboarding for a second, it's almost more impressive what people do because it's so, it's so removed from like the normal activity of snowboarding. Mm. Absolutely. Now I'd like to talk about, we haven't talked about uh, 91 Words for Snow um, that video doesn't get the shine it deserves. A great soundtrack. When I was a rail kid, I used to just watch the Quebec section. Uh, but upon revisiting it in my uh, older age, I've grown to love the whole video. It, specifically, hanging out with Mike Bassich in Alaska seems fucking insane. How was that experience? The coolest, seriously. Like, I mean, shout out to Mikey Bassich. I think, I mean, I think luckily, like in the past, like two decades or something, I feel like he ha- he got the shine he deserves. But he is such a unique, incredible character. Yeah, I think Mike Bassich needs a little air little horn yeah. hit there. Yeah, oh, I think. I've been there's so many names. I've been apologized for all the air horns I missed. Continue. Yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, <clears throat> I was incredibly um, lucky or as super coincidental because um, Christopher and I were driving up to Alaska. That was like we were we were filming After Lame, and we were like, oh. We're going up to Alaska because for the first time we're kind of doing some Alaskan riding and stuff. Uh, we have our car, have our sleds, and our plan was just to drive up those whatever ten days. And we're in Whistler. And we took one day sledding. We went, went we took out uh, one day sledding. Kind of, I don't know. I don't think we shot anything. And we randomly bump into Mike Bassage. And Mike Bassage is somebody that like I had maybe like we had seen each other once maybe, but we didn't know each other. Yeah. I did though. By the way, also interesting thing. In ninety four, I took a T bar run with Mikey Bassage in Germany hmm. at wow. a European Championships, and I I like waited my turn, like kind of na- navigated in the line to be on the T bar with him. Wow. Yeah, I was like, I remember, and then we, and I, I saw him in Whistler. I'm like, or I don't know, after like hanging out for a bit, I'm like, I'm like, do you know that we like took a T-bar with you in 94. I was really excited. But, um... <laughs> Whatever you say, kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was... Uh, so he was in Whistler, and he was like... He got my number somewhere and texted me. He's like, hey, I hear you guys are driving up to Alaska. Do you want to drive, like, caravan style? Like, and I was just like, why? Sure, why... I mean, yeah. I don't know. And like without him, we would have never made it up there. <laughs> like we had like broken the strings of our uh, springs of our trailer. We broke. Like we had, I think, like two flat tires. Ran out of gas once. Like every single time, it's like Mike. Mike was like there, like helping us fixing it. And then we ended up staying the entire time in Alaska together. And then next year, when um, we made ninety one words for snow, I was like, this this guy's incredible. I mean, he lives in his van most of the time, like during the winter. And yeah, then that's how the coincidence, you know, it's coincidence how that idea came about that he's someone that we should feature. Mm-hmm. And you were telling me, uh, driving up to Brighton that you also were snowmobiling all around Alaska with no ropes and there's crevasses everywhere and it's wildly dangerous. And then you went hellying and the guides had some words. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that just kind of shows the level I think also like the level of sketchiness that we were operating in compared to like proper like mountaineering people. I mean, we were literal jump guys, no idea of crevasses or anything. And then you have Jake Price mini bike up there with you, who's really, I mean, he's so loose. <laughs> and Christoph is also not really scared of anything. And then Mikey, he thinks he's a mountaineer, but I don't know about that. And then I'm just like the reasonable scared person that is just like, yeah, I can't like force all those people to adhere to my ridiculous safety standards. So we're like, dude, so we were like dropping in, like, I'm not shitting you. They were doing stuff like maybe had like a shitty like 90s Garmin that you could see like some sort of map, don't know what the map is. And we're like, I think we can ride down here. And you know, Alaska, and we dropped down 
in terrain that is so steep, like on, a sl- on sleds, that's so steep that you know you can't get up and you know there's a glacier down there. You don't know if the glacier is maybe like 20 foot disconnected from yeah. where you ride down. Yeah. And everybody's like, no, that sounds fine. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you guys? <laughs> Dude, seriously, it's like 90% of the time I was like losing my shit and just like following them. And then everything worked, you know, of course, then everything works out, you know, it's just, but yeah, what I told Chris is that we were ripping around on a glacier, like looking for lines, like hiking around. And we were like, oh, this is pretty cool. We should afford to get one heli flight out here and shoot this. So like next day we get a heli, we fly out, the guy lands, gets out. He's super tense, the guide and starts probing a circle of safety around us that we shouldn't leave. And like our like walking tracks are like <laughs> all over the fucking place, <laughs> which she doesn't know it's ours. And we're like, and he's like what dumbass walked over there? Yeah, and we're like, and he, he was like, <laughs> you, stay, a certain death. <laughs> yeah, you stay here. And like, there's, you know, like everywhere it's crevasses. And I'm just like, dude. <laughs> These guys are just. Um, I can't believe that we and and we bought like, dude. We we we, we bought like everything they could possibly need for like an Arctic expedition at REI or something. Like the week before, <laughs> like I rolled up with like a fucking ice axe, and like I remember show up and somebody's like, "Why do you have ice axe?" I'm like, "I, I don't know. Do you, you don't need an ice axe." They're like. No, it seems super dangerous on your backpack. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's right. It seems super dangerous, you know. So yeah, it's sharp as shit. Yeah, dude, like, like just all this stuff. And now, I'm sorry, Chris, I bring this up that I got into rock climbing. Like, I know a little bit of like safety stuff, and I'm like, dude, what the fuck? Like, whatever would have happened, no way we could have gotten anyone out of a crevasse or anything. So yeah. like, <laughs> I'm still thinking Mikey could have sort of. He he knows more than mm-hmm. like he repelled down stuff and whatnot but like and yeah. then jake was telling me a great story about how you rode you got to alaska rode your first line and uh there was no no one was filming really huh you told, oh you, you know what christoph got the bump up and you thought christoph was you know filming. what that is five minutes after the circle of safety <laughs> he, seriously like like no shit that was, that was like there's like 100 yards from the circle of safety they bumped me up and Jake got like, I think in the door of the heli, like super complicated, you know, it's not drones and stuff. It's like mega complicated, get get the shots. And like, we're also in like a super tight budget, right? Like we're kind of trying to like wing this film and like make it look like we have yeah. like an absent budget, but we're like, if we get this one heli shot, it'll be dope. But, and, and then, yeah, he flew like somewhere I was riding. There's like <laughs> no correlation between the two, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fun safety. with those guys. Circle of safety, classic yeah. surf circle of safety scenario. You've seen it once. You've seen it a million times. Yeah. Uh, we got a bunch of Patreon questions. We haven't hit any of those. Let's fire a couple up. Yeah, we got one about ninety-one words. Oh, we did. Um, yeah, uh, you brought up the soundtrack, Chris. And this question has to do with that. Uh, it's from Tom Wilson North. The question is: the soundtrack to ninety-one words for snow was seminal. How were you involved with that? Uh, well, thanks for the compliments. Um, what does seminal mean? Just yeah, for I was asking I, for a I, was, did I you, said did you it see assuming my... someone else would know. Yeah, I was looking at Hav. I'm like, it's like containing semen. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah. Okay. 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 Pre- yeah. Proceed. Okay. Yeah. As you okay, were. perfect. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, no, I, we were uh, primarily, I think, Chris, Stuff, and I, for the most part, I think we have a fairly similar music taste. And so, um, and oh wait, hold on. This is actually pretty important. Then Florent, I don't know if you guys know Florent. Yeah. Flo- Florent de Maria. Um, he is a French musician and music licensing guy and like good friend of ours. And so he supplied us with a shit ton of because I mean, this is before like Spotify discovering discovering is a lot of work. Yeah, and so I think he hooked us up with incredible amount of like great music to listen stuff, through, yeah. just to be exposed to it. So He's, that was a gigantic. And he also licensed it, li- like helped us license um, most of the music. He's done is, that a lot for a lot of projects. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I think um, if I remember correctly, I think Christoph and I were kind of had like the hats on for a music choice and and, and picking that out. It's also always really fun. 
Sweet. Yeah, we had a question from Stuck in Ohio kind of about music rights and licensing, so that kind of answers that. And if we're just running through Patreon should questions. Hit, should hit that Theo one. That's exactly where I, I was like going. It. Perfect. Great nice. minds think alike. Um, we have a question from Theo. It kind of goes back to inspirations. Um, Theo wants to know, the double back shifty three is my favorite feeling trick of all time. How did you come up with this dub shifty idea? And was it an inspiration from any of the snowboard homies? Um, Hang on one sec. We just... Uh, people's champ. <coughs> That's the technique. You got to kind of wave it around. I a think little so bit. too. Okay. Uh, <coughs> That's good. Um, yeah. That one like went into oh. my throat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do that sometimes. Yeah. Seminal. <laughs> that was a seminal experience. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, uh, shifty one eighty. Well, um, I mean, there's been a bunch of, obviously, across, like, all of snowboarding history, people, like, tune Revines. Re, revines. That's really... Revines. Like, revines. <laughs> they were doing the Revines. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Don't do the Revines. <laughs> um, Who is your daddy and what does he do? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So... Um, no, there's a lot of people, obviously, like uh, Todd Schlosser comes to mind, like a bunch of those guys. Dave Lee, right? Is it Dave? Mm. Dave Lee, right? Yep. He also did a bunch of rewinds. So um, I think there's a bunch of like inspiration to do that. And just, um, I don't know, I think, you know what, it, you know what, it, I think what like, for me, what um, I always want to do, you know, when you do like a back 180 on a slope and you do more like you do it when you skate, you do an ollie. And you land your back trucks first and kind of kind of pivot, pivot. Like a late late, yeah. and I think that's so much fun. And I always thought like, ah, oh, be fun to do that kind of like do a big back swing eighty, but kind of land a little bit like that. And I think a, that's a little bit where that comes from. Where you, you have a little bit of a shifty, but you go back and then you turn last second. Um, yeah, because I remember those tricks had been done, but I think it had been... Not like, cab I, nine. Nobody had done the cab well, nine. I'm talking about like more so like the yeah. 180s. <laughs> and it, I think it had just been a while since I think so eyes too. had been on that. I and think it so. was just, Peter Line was in, the to- in that were, mix for those. He did some shifty stuff. Oh, it's true. He did a lot of like uh, uh, like like overspun rewind, right? Mm-hmm. I just remember those like really standing out. And, you know, two 180s like yeah, really standing so. out. Yeah. It was like pretty interesting. I got yeah. some more fake news from Pierre on that. He's, he claimed that the shifties... Oh. Where because Aaron's style, you had to do one spin True. under a five forty, right? True. Um, yeah, they, which is kind of, I mean, it's an interesting thing about today's snowboarding, right? That they already struggled with back then. Everybody comes to the event, does like cab nine. You have like ten cab nines in one front. Like, how do you judge that? Is that interesting to watch, et cetera? So they introduced it, Aaron's style. They were like, we have like two tech jumps and two style jumps, or something they called it, I think, and they had to be under five forty. So it's kind of a cool concept, but at the same time, it is weird because it like artificially tried to like box people in, and then the style jump was, I think, also kind of cheesy in a way. Um, but that's why I, you know, you had to do them. Um, so Pierre's right. Mm. Yeah. What about the cab nine shifty? Because that was you pioneered that. Um, yeah, I think that probably came out of the ba- um, that came out of the backside one eighty. You know, I was like, oh, might be interesting to kind of see if you can halt your spin and then like rewind. And I think there's still a bunch of, I mean, people have done some really cool shit the last couple of years. Like, I think that's like, I mean, insane stuff. Like most of the stuff I, I was, I was like, ah, oh, cool. Like I get it. And then the other day I saw, I think it was probably Rene or someone yeah. did like the it backside like, double cork the, 10 the physics, and reverted. Like, didn't make sense. Reverted yeah. like the last 180, I think. And I was like, that is insane. Like that. Some of the stuff looks so surprising. So, um, and like Zeb Powell's done a few things where like the physics, like yeah, it genuinely it's don't not work. Add yeah. yeah. Not add now. Well, it's yeah. again, the, I think they use the same technology after being used robot yeah. food. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. they actually got in that Mac Dog technology. They got the, the Jurassic, Mac, the Park, Jurassic Park. Yeah. yeah, they got Jurassic Park. I think got, yeah, I think so too. AI. Yeah. We got another Patreon? Yeah, we can uh, bring it back to robot food for a second. We got a question from Benny Pellegrino, Ooh. avid Patreon supporter. Ooh, Shout out, awesome. Benny. Um, Benny wants to know who surprised you the most while you were filming robot food and maybe if you have an MVP from each film. Oh, wow. That's a really good question. Um, Who surprised me the most? Let's go MVP first because it's easier maybe Mm -hmm. then. So MVP, I think, 
all throughout Robot Food, I think the singular MVP is Travis Barker. I think it's yeah. his spirit, his personality, his quirkiness, creative ideas. Without Travis Parker, there would not be Robot Food. I'm 100% sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, he's such a unique character. And I mean, you guys know him. So it's like, yeah. it's, I think um, he really, that was like magical to witness, you know? Um, yeah. And so MVP after Bank, for sure, Travis Parker. MVP lame. Maybe also Travis Parker, but could also be. It's really hard for me to think because I'm thinking on every film. I'm like, I'm the MVP, right? So I have to sub. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> like substitute myself. Besides, besides you, oh, yeah. Obviously. The substitute. That's how. That's move how. Move me out of the yeah. way. Who's yeah. left? That, yeah. That, who's left? <laughs> Who's that's, this, uh, that's, yeah, it actually says, who's the second place MVP? Perfect, thank you. Obvious answer, you. me, next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think you see, you see on lame and mm. then who's, I mean, and then after lame is just such a chaos show. I mean, it's like, it's really funny because I, I don't think that like, I remember like halfway through the season, I'm like, should we give this like a concept? Because it seems pretty chaotic the way we're like, and then that just like melded into what it became, which is cool, but it was definitely pretty chaotic. Like, um, so it's funny, like, um, like Dirksen comes to mind, but maybe also because he's new, like he's like, that was really like, it's just such an incredible all around snowboarder that when you snowboard with him, you feel like a bad snowboarder. You know what I mean? Mm. I'm not yeah. even sure. Like, I don't really, yeah. I don't yeah. really like now when I think of the videos, I don't, I can't really remember like the specific tricks, but he's one of those people where you're like, ah, oh, I suck at this, you know? Like, just because he's, yeah, he's got something. He's got something yeah. and he's, he will not fall over and you will tomahawk like past him, you know? Um, yeah, I'd say, um, oh, you know, I got a great MVP for uh, After Lame. It's Guillaume Morissette. Yeah. Just because he's like he is probably the one of the most underrated snowboarders of all time. Mm. Uh, I mean, he was always like scared of bigger stuff, which is also why he kind of stepped away from like a lot of the the things we were doing. He didn't like the fear aspect, but his like technical ability is and insane. like center weight and like the weight and creativity in, and, everything. and creativity. Yeah. And style and is incredible. He's such a yeah. That was really really nuts. He's still ripping too. He's ripping, dude. We had a conversation at Do Tour a couple of years ago when he was there, and I, we were talking tricks because he's a switchback rodeo guy. I'm a switchback rodeo guy. Oh, you and, are too. And That's so right. we were. I mean, I got five tricks, so it's like we really <laughs> fucking nourish these things and just hold them. <laughs> I just hold it really fucking close to the heart. But we were talking different grabs, and I was like, man, it would be cool to see one, switchback rodeo, but you grab. Like how Tor Gear does switchback five method, and when you're upside down, I was like, I would love to see somebody do that with a switchback rodeo. The axis is different, and you're a switchback rodeo guy. Like no more than like three weeks later, he's in Quebec building a little backcountry jump, winging these things. Like, and it didn't come to light just right, but it's he's still charging, which is amazing. He won the U.S. Open in the pipe. Yep, let's not forget. Never yeah, forget. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 He's kind of like the greatest low altitude pipe rider of all time. Yeah. You know. Totally. Switch God. Yeah. Switch uh, Michael switch, Chuck. Switch Michael Chuck. By the way, the junior roles in 99 that were my, like my, my best result ever, he was on also underrated brand, Original Sin. Oh, Sin. Wow. He was wow. on Original Sin doing switch, switch Michael Chuck first hit. And I think, I'm trying to think, he didn't win. No. He didn't win because you won. No, I didn't win. Oh, you didn't I win. No, I got second. Oh, you got second. Okay. I got second. I got second. I think it's like uh, Adam. Do you guys remember Adam Petraska? Adam Petraska was a guy on Burton. He won like what feels like seven junior world championships in a row, just like dominating. And then I think I don't know. It would be interesting to hear what, like, um, if he just stepped away from it or he got injured or something. But uh, hmm. he won that. I'm pretty sure. Uh, you should hit that Bo Brown Patreon question. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, question from Bo Brown. I think I saw, I think I saw David Benedict do the first double 12 in competition at the Vail sessions around 2010. At least that's what I tell everybody. Is my memory correct? Were you first? 
Probably, I would think. I think that's um, like that could that could be true. Um, did we talk about um, recently about how if um, sometimes you do a line in a contest or anywhere, and you kind of have this like almost bet in your head where oh, if I land this, I could try this. Almost like you're jinxing, like you're thinking like ooh this like the the stars align, and which is completely like it's ridiculous. But I remember. I had like one run down, which was kind of safe. And I was like, oh, I could kind of like try to do like all four nines in a run or something or all three nines and then the last one, whatever. And I was like, if I land that cab nine, remember, I've, I remember I was like, if I land a cab nine shifty on the jump on the before the last zone, I could just try double corked. Like just, and I'd never done one on a step down. Like to me, it was like really scary and everything. And then that just happened. I landed and I was like, all right, I got to go got to do it like in the run and just like super scary and but yeah that's did you win the veil session no i got second is sean white no kevin, andreas pierce. Wig. kevin pierce no andreas no, Wig. no, no, no kevin no. pierce in 2008 or no something. um really interesting because i haven't heard or haven't seen anything for like a long time you guys south lake tahoe rockstar energy super chucker josh oh. feliciano no yeah. no oh Chaz guldemont that's who oh, it is yeah, Chaz yeah. guldemont okay. he won yeah yeah, yeah. Maybe or under his week. I'm sorry. Could be like maybe, but I. So there, I distinctly remember because I, I went to the Vale session somewhere in that three range. I went back to back years at whatever oh six to oh ten or whatever. I don't know what fucking year it was, but there was a big thing around all four nines being landed in a competition run, and I feel like you, Sean, and Kevin Pierce, you, I Sean, think, and Andreas were the ones that were battling it out. Is this made up in my story in my head? Because that's what I remember. Could be my my well concussed brain that just like where that's just yeah. not but I think I mean yeah I don't think I've I don't think I've ever done that. I don't I mean maybe that was a thing where I'm like it would be cool to you, do. You did. It was in two thousand seven. I re- I remember because this was the year I was going to become the team manager at Solomon. And I remember you took second at that contest. Yeah. And I think Kevin Pierce took first. Could actually, be. I could be totally blown know. this. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is this old, There's not enough. Yeah, I was chucking. There. I was chucking. That but contest I think, was at night, wasn't it? Yeah. And so they do fire on the bat last they jump. Do fire on the night. jumps. I remember everything. that. Yeah. Gotta bring yeah. that back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, park park jumps at night. A four pack Shakur. Holy smokes! Yeah. Miss me with that. And then remember they had the flames that were going off and stuff too. Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> Wild. Should we just smack a quick uh, run through a wall? Sure. For those who don't need doors. David, take us out on the one. I kind of like giving it a smack on the table. Yeah. Ooh, when it's... Oh, oh, oh. So oh that... my God. They're so different. Like, the intensity this is... One, this the... one is, like, by yeah. far the craziest. <coughs> Ooh. 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 Oh, that, yeah. They are grass-fed, oh. organic. <coughs> Free range, free range. How do yeah. how do how are they made? Like what is like what well, is smelling? So they've actually farmed them organically from, uh, a, from sustainable, a, in Toronto, a sustainable Toronto, a sustainable source. Um, honestly, I have no idea. I think it's ammonia. Okay, and uh, don't ask too many questions because we don't know too many answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I had another question with ninety-one words or snow. All right, so. Pretty simple. I mean, the, you combine all types of snowboarding. For those who haven't seen, there's Quebec, there's Park, there's Alaska. It's like all these kind of different little ecosystems and snowboarding. What were you trying to accomplish when you set out to make that video? Um, I think maybe I wanted to have a little more of a maybe mainstreamish approach to showing snowboarding. That was one thing I thought like it'd be cool to show like a wholesome or holistic yeah. image of snowboarding that maybe other people could understand too. So I think there was sort of kind of in between like that I personally get excited about all sorts of snowboarding. And also I was like, it's kind of a bummer that we make these like super niche videos that only us and our friends get. And, like, I can't even show them to my friends in Munich. I mean, they come out to the premiere because there's, like, a free beer or something, and they think it's, like, cool that I'm upside down, like, through the air, but they don't get it. Yeah. And I thought, like, ah, oh, it'd be kind of nice to make something that, that they kind of understand, too. Mm. Cool. Something. Yeah, Mission Accomplished, I was watching it with my fiance brushing up on it, and she was, like, learning all kinds of stuff and just, like, whoa. 
this is what you guys like the Quebec thing. Like this is what you guys do. Like suddenly she's super worried about you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, not anymore. But this is what I do. I sit in this chair. Not a whole lot of risk back here. We're doing all right. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, we should talk about design because uh, I think it started with this uh, pro model, right, with Solomon. And one thing we got to, to highlight on that is the one fifty seven point five. Is that something I came up with? Uh, is that, that was the my size? My question to you, yeah. What, you, it was in your size run. There was like a 54, a 57.5, and a 61 or something like that. I have no but idea. A 57.5. I always I'm thought like, man, he's so meticulous. Like, no. Yeah, we, yeah. It's so funny. That's like when the German prejudice comes in and it's like, like I'm the worst, <laughs> dude. I would sit at these like Salman product meetings and they'd be like, how do you like that we, we made the toe cap extendable? I'm like, whoa! Like, like three years later, I'm like, you can extend the toe cap with a binding? Like, you know, like I didn't, I, I still like just slap my bindings on sort of, you know, and like kind of, kind of, the only thing I know is like, I don't like too much forward lean, kind of hurts my knees. That's it. And I like camber boards with like that are poppy. And, but I think- You thought you liked it. I thought I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I mean- Maybe it was just the guys in France being like, I think oh, so. he's German. Let's get super specific on the size. I thought too, like back in the day, I would think that they had their sort of sizes and it's like, you you get a pro model. We, we base it off this. You're able to tweak some things, but it's like, I don't think I came up with like, I want 155.5. If you think about what point, 157.5 is like like this much it's yeah yeah it's not enough to ever you'd never notice it well i can i could i as a person that wrote a 157 at the time i always i always liked a 158 oh, but some sometimes yeah. sometimes yeah, you boards that you know sometimes that? boards yeah. would be a no yeah. no no i just preferred it because i just oh, it just seemed bigger in my mind mm. but a 157 was only available in certain models <laughs> and a 158 was available in others like arbitrarily assigned and so maybe they were just kind of thinking, oh, some people like 57, some people like 58. We'll just do it right in the middle. Just catch that huge target group together. <laughs> yeah. Just like <laughs> merge the target groups. <laughs> yeah, like exactly. The, yeah. All right, what about the thought process of the angles on the graphic? That was just like a thought that, you know how people like also like Hetzel and, and Selaznik put their like the trucks on them. Yeah. And I thought that never, I mean, idea was cool. Like I love those graphics. They're legendary, but I was like, it's not really what it looks like because you don't you don't ride like that. And I was like, it w wouldn't it be interesting if you saw like where the feet were approximately. So it was more of a thought like, could it look cool? And then my graphic design skills at the time like were limited to like making a couple squares. <laughs> so I put a couple <laughs> squares on the base. I'm like, sounds good. And then it's so funny too when you're an athlete at like that like pro level, and then you sense something. They're like, it's great. Let's go. I'm like, <laughs> wow, I, that was easy. <laughs> like, I didn't. Mean, I mean. Yeah, pretty lucky that like it could have made some hideous stuff, but just like that, you're a graphic designer. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. That is kind of the beauty. You get Make to it. you get to just straight up. You go from no skills to a pro model that you've designed instead of like having to go through school and and all. But you did go through school. Yeah. No, no, I went. I went only went to film school. Okay. Yeah. Then I remember you did the one with like the elongated letters that you had to kind of like yeah. tilt the board down yeah. to look at. Connect it. That the was dots. Kind of an interesting idea. The dots? No, no, it's, it's like, like the board. The letters were like really tall to where like if you're looking at the base, you can't really decipher what it says. You, it just looks like a like grid. Tip it. But when you angle. look at it, like looking okay, from yeah. above, you could kind of read it. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was kind of neat. But anyways, fast forward, like that sort of being like the origin of like your appetite for design, like. Where has that taken you ultimately? Like, what sort of things do you find yourself doing now? And yeah, so I mean, that fairly not quite linear because I went to film school and then like went back to work again, worked for a bigger agency. Um, but ultimately, kind of, there is a, a a line between like just doing like a robot food poster or something. Um, and now, primarily, my job is in brand and design, so I do like brand strategy for all sorts of companies. Um, and design. So sometimes it's only strategy, sometimes it's only design. So it could be anything from like you're like finding out the core values of your business with like your executives to uh, just designing a website with everything else already in place. So it could be could be anything basically. Um, and yeah, 
that's it's fun. It's a lot of it's a like sometimes I'm think it's a lot of computer time, which I'm like not too excited about because it's also kind of crazy thinking about like. I mean, we're on a snowboard podcast. We're super active people. Like we need this like thing that we do with our bodies, and then like you like all other people on the planet, you sit in front of a fucking computer. That's something I struggle with a little bit, but I I, I like I like it. Um, um, and I think like if I could like just like pick like add something to it, then I would like it'd be really cool to work on like um, also some like journalistic like mel- melding like journal journalism and design like i mean yeah print media is not really something that is it's pretty hard to i think make a living in anything that is a print me- medium mm-hmm. um but that's something that i'm <clears throat> really really into still like um yeah but yeah primarily so that's where it led me well, there was the Danish porn thing too that could also be like yeah, that's something to think about in the future. I'm not sure if the journalism or if it was the Danish porn that could be a magazine. You think? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it could print well. Could could yeah. print well. I like that. Now, I'd like to sink our teeth into this Solomon logo situation because I saw I watched this little video, Evolution of the Solomon logo, and like every few years, it's changed by like fucking five percent. Okay. <laughs> And I'm looking, and they're like, we need a new logo. We got David Benedict to do our new logo, and looks great, okay? <laughs> looks great. I'm, I'm not trying to shoot any holes in it, but, like, I would like to for you in your design jargon to explain what you were trying to accomplish, what was different between the previous logo yeah. and what you designed. So sort of have to correct you because the previous logo is actually way different. previous logo is really soft, is small letters, right? It's not caps. Um, and the one that we did is, um, kind of like an iteration or like a, a, like a a changed up version of the one they used in like the nineties that Neville Brody, this typography mastermind, um, did. And basically, so they had a super like, so in terms of like the process in this case, it was super unorthodox because... Um, normally these things take like super long, but there's a new creative director who wanted to make his, make a mark. And, uh, and so that was done a lot, like in a much more like a sprint, sprint fashion where they get, you know, there was two teams involved, like both were sent off with like in a very narrow corridor. Like they knew they wanted to kind of use their old heritage logo to kind of connect to that being a mountain company for a long time, but bring it into today and there's one specific strategic um a goal which is maybe sort of interesting from the outset is like they wanted one logo that could work on any product so and that was kind of interesting because then suddenly i came in from like i think it helped me uh evaluating at their their ambition or kind of the the drafts um because i knew like this had to work on a snowboard had to work on a snowboard and on a fucking like cool sneaker and on a like um like nordic skis you know so i think i think that's and then if um you acquire some sort of like typographic eye after a while then i think and knowing primarily it's knowing it's knowing codes i think that's what graphic design to a large extent is at least the 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 type i do is almost more i'm i have to be proficient or liter uh um is it literate? Literate. Literate in visual codes. If something is like, if, if you know, like somebody does something like super italic and sharp and it goes into performance, like I will have to, like my job is to know, like people will pick that up as like dynamic, fast. as fast, you yeah. know. If, and so if somebody uh, asked me to create like, a corporate design for a brand of organic juices, I will not use italic super fast, you know. I mean, we all know this by heart, but I think then if you do that professionally, you're just trained in seeing, deciphering, and basically not only decoding, but coding, you know, saying like, are we... And so a lot of, I I think in a lot of ways, I'm not even like much of a creative in a sense. I'm much more an editor, you know. And then it's about like, of course, it has to like hold up in terms of craft, right? Mm-hmm. It has to be like properly done. And but in this term, I also work with a really great um, uh, typographer that I work with, Ricardo Ferrol, um, together. And then like so, we kind of like 
send stuff back and forth, you know? And so, yeah, I think a lot of what I do is not necessarily creative, but more maybe matching a particular strategy with a particular visual, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that can be exciting, can also not be exciting, you know? Yeah. I, I find it interesting. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated. Listening to Draplin come on the show, he's a great designer. Uh, he said something that I thought was really interesting. Like when you're creating a logo, it needs to look good from like three inches, three feet, and 3,000 feet. Yeah. Is that something you think about in that space? Or I guess it's even yeah. more specific. In some There's way. a lot of rules like that where I think that um, a lot of them, those apply. Like that one's still very valid. There's a lot of really old school ones that didn't really think about the digital, you know, like mm-hmm. it can't, it, it has to work black and white. And so I'm like, yeah, but like how often do you still print like, um, you know, letter letterheads and stuff so i think there's um a lot of stuff there's going to be a lot more going into motion and everything so okay um, when you take a look at this run through wall bottle how do you interpret what the font's saying like can you can yeah. you just like I mean, digest first it. of all this is break, garbage break it down yeah break it down no break it down i want to i want to <laughs> hear right, how right. you interpret be the honest right. be honest all right so i like it so i mean one thing there, i mean two things right so the wall and the font obviously both have like this toughness right so to me, this is like this works in like an environment that's like could be like boxing or like like pretty masculine fitness. It's obviously like a quotation of that style, right? It's not entirely serious. But if somebody showed this to me, I didn't know anything about it. I would think this would be like this could be like a penis enlargement pill. Yes, that's what we're going right? for. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what we're good. going that for. Works. That, yep. That's exactly really? yep. perfect. <laughs> I mean, that's the A plus. <laughs> Uh, a plus uh, graphic design, though. So wait, are, I don't are think our like, penises enlarging I'm, since we've I, been doing the... <laughs> Mine has been <laughs> enlarging. Yeah, that's, 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 I've been rock hard since <laughs> yeah. we started the show. But, you know, that's also on typography. That's good. When you that's take good. run through Healthy. a wall, you have a three-letter word, a seven-letter word, a single letter, and a four. It's a bit of a disaster from a typography standpoint. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, there's... Yeah. I mean, then then you end up with the craft aspect. If somebody has a lot of experience, yep. they will be able to, like, put a lot of options together that work. And to be honest, I'm still struggling with that because, I mean, as much as I design, I would think that somebody who's, like, a, I don't know, like, a senior designer in a big agency has a lot more work on his plate than I do. Like, just, like, in terms of, like, quantity, like, mm. like volume, you know, that yeah. they, so. Crank it out. Sometimes I work with people, I'm like, holy shit, they're fast. Because, like, I think I can, I'm at the point where I, I can get the desired result, I think, at a very high level, or a somewhat high level. But, like, like I'm not made for the real world. I, like, I have to, like, and I spend weekends and do stuff. So, it's, um, but you're absolutely right. Like, that's the stuff where then I think, like, like professionalism comes in. People mm-hmm. who can do that in less time than they charge the client. That's essentially, I think, the calculation. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Right? And, and, and I'm like, yeah, I take like three times as long as the client pays me, so it's like not the best. So can you explain, so just for the people that listen, I'd love to hear some actual examples of projects that you've worked on, aside from the Solomon rebrand, um, <coughs> just so I can have a better understanding, because yeah. I'm not entirely yeah, sure yeah. of everything you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, maybe uh, three different ones. Uh, one is like I did a full like 360 degree corporate design for a hotel chain um, and then like also did like the brand work with them like all the like you know brand values um, basically um, god I'm missing an English word what fillers um, now I'm thinking about um, of, uh, yeah like value proposition basically yeah. to the outside right like the, the so, USP. Yeah. So basically you work on you work on the brand, <clears throat> um, but then it goes so like minuscule from like all the fu- like from the logo that is on the friggin' building to um the signage that is like in the garage in the garage to the, the the little thing that's on the door or the numbers or something, right? So um that's one like very holistic. That would be like almost like the best case where you say you are involved in the very beginning and you kind of, then you have, you know, you, you figure everything out. And then by the time everything's kind of approved, then you just set out to kind of like do it for every single part of the business. And just um, to interrupt, you, you are the, uh, an agency. So then you're picking and pulling different people for different jobs, right? Yeah, and you're yeah. the company that they hire to do yeah, it. I'm the person that they hire. Then and the outside looks like a company kind of. 
Uh, what are the other two examples? Yeah, other two examples would be um, like a purely um, strategic work, which is like um, I did like a basically the kind of like a brand positioning of a publishing house. They have like multiple titles, like um, and then they are kind of in a rut. They don't really know what why like something's not aligning. Like people don't really know what their magazine is. Mm. And then throughout the years, because I've worked with like really good strategists, I basically kind of have on the on the fly acquired like a lot of their techniques. So it's and it's not rocket science. It's basically a lot of times I think uh, if people come in from the outside, it's not because they're better or they have specific. It's because it's unpolitical. They come in. You can't tell your boss or your employee that their work sucks. But if somebody else comes in, evaluates it, yeah. and that's and in this case, like yeah. we come in. And we interviewed everybody in like basically the the C suite and like um, just kind of like getting their uh, look on the situation, and then we present that to everybody anonymized, for instance. And then we work together with like two day workshops on like trying to figure out like you guys are trying to get to this person or have this content, but your adver advertisers, for instance, do this or or digital media does that, that doesn't work. And then we um, we kind of try to align like the brand with uh, maybe the brand with the authentic skills that the company has. Because a lot of times they pre people will say like, we're this and you look at it, you're like, no, you're not. Yeah. You know? And you as an outsider can look at it like entirely objectively with like no yeah. emotional connection yeah. to any of it that exactly. distorts your view. And I think we all do that, right? On some other level, like we sometimes we're like like, you know, we do like you, you you try to be something and then but I think it's really simple. Like brand in essence is really only like the people and what they're capable of and what they do. Yeah. And if you and if you articulate that well and clear, I think it's like really easy to to have a culture in place or not really easy but it's that's the possible, first step yeah. possible to have a culture in place where also those people that you want find you you know because if you're pretend, pretending to be like uh, a police officer but you're actually a fireman and like a bunch of people like apply because they want to be police officers you know and then you're like no man we're we're fire company like that so mm. yeah I don't know, it's a little too abstract? or No, I like it. I, I'm, I didn't know that's what you guys did. And then you had one more example. Yeah, and maybe the one, uh, the other one would be just like um, doing one specific task, like um, like say, um, like just like somebody has everything strategically in place and they're like, we need a visual language. So that'd be like only the visual part. Like for instance, I did that for Gore. The Basically it's like Gore, like the company next to Gore-Tex. Um, and then like we did, then we, you know, we look at like the image style and um, typography. Like we basically designed just the visual language, but everything else is in place. Like they say, we, we already figured out we want to be this, 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 mm -hmm. this. How do we kind of improve our look that people recognize that this is who we are? And then it's pretty easy because suddenly if you're like, oh, wait, if you're a super technical brand, um, then maybe like all your communication should look fairly technical and reduced, just as reduced as the clothing, mm -hmm. for instance, right? So yep. you kind of try to just basically make people um, uh, recognize what it is they're looking at. That's like, you yeah. know, if you guys are going for penis enlargement pills, you fucking nailed it, <laughs> yep. you know? Maybe one thing, like one last thing about brand, which I think is real important, like if you do something authentically because you're into it, you don't need anything. You don't need like, a designer. You don't no. need a fucking strategist. Because yeah, everything, everything checks out. Everything, everything makes sense. And plus you're like, and then you can be also kind of off that maybe you're not really like perfectly efficiently talking to everybody. Like people recognize you maybe not, but not like at the first sight, but it's way more important that like it translates that what you do is kind of authentic. And I think that is incredible that, and this is kind of a little bit of a bridge to snowboarding. It's incredible that you can look at something and for some magical reason it translates if it's authentic or pretentious. And that is style. Look at it. I mean, somebody does like a trick and you're like, if Nico Muller does a fucking really cool butter and I'm like, that's a dope. Or if somebody just does like 
just because it's the thing or whatever, you know, it's, yeah. it's so wild. And it, I think it's, um, it's really, it's almost like impossible to grasp that that really happens, but it almost like trickles down, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Have you ever heard the term? I mean, we've talked about it a lot, but I love, uh, the, the explaining the vehicle of snowboarding as a form of just self-expression. Yeah. And you can see there's people like you're talking about Nicholas or Gigi or there's so many people or Arthur, like almost like true creatives really express themselves. Scott Stevens, they express themselves in their snowboard. And uh, then then there's some people that are just doing what they think they should. Mm. Yeah. If I, I'm supposed yeah. to do a, I'm supposed to do a, this trick and you're like, it shows in their style. Mm. But I think even just in the first place that you are able to grasp a character by looking at how they move, I think is fascinating because I mean, if I, you know, if I, for instance, like compared my snowboarding to Gigi, like I am not as intuitive and spontaneous and creative, but what I can do is like, if I know the bound, if I knew the boundaries, like a jump and this and this and this, then I can maybe that's like my space. I can create like something that's maybe a little more, you know, like, like thought out and maybe a little stiff, but that's, that can also like without any judgmental judgment, that's, I think it's just important that like you do you kind of, yeah. right. And, yep. um, yeah. And it's interesting because like, like, uh, my girlfriend, she's, she's a filmmaker, but she's also a choreographer. So I hang out with, sometimes I hang out with like her dance people. They do like performance dance. So if to, uh, to us, I don't want to know, maybe you're really in dance, but to me, Half of the time, like people like ro- like they're like crawling around on the floor on like a dark stage, you know. It's like I'm trying to f- get it, yeah. and it's really interesting. Like it can be really, it can be super inspirational. But like to me, that's kind of the space that I, to me, I don't have the visual competency or or, or experience to judge that. It's I'm like well, that's interesting, it's interesting movements, but they have the eye to see if that is authentic or pretentious, but I can't, because yeah. I don't know the, the movement, I'm like, I don't really get it. Sometimes I get it emotionally, but it's so interesting that they have the exact same thing like in skateboarding, snowboarding, where you see something and you just like, oh, there's something special about it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, and the, it, that's the difficult thing about judging snow competitive snowboarding runs on something that's, it is uh, subjective to the viewer. In a way, though, mm-hmm. too, even though you do see some, but like I might, there's like we talk about it all the time. I watch snowboarding with my friends. I adore a certain clip, and my my the guy right next to me might hate the fucking thing. That's yeah, it's interesting, huh? Yeah, and then oftentimes like a like a a person's style, like you had mentioned, like Gigi's really loose and yeah. maybe reactive to the mountain, interpretive, whereas like you're more linear, or like like you kind of want your boundaries defined, and you'll like totally max out in that situation and then there's a guy like Mark Frank Montoya who like his style is kind of it's like powerful but like slow moving like almost the way mm-hmm. he is like generally you know and it's just interesting that like it, the style whether it's a person that dances or skates or snowboards or whatever is so oftentimes like a really like interesting reflection of yeah. like who they are and how they operate generally. My, uh, I'm not sure what my point is there. Um, oh, it's great observation. No, I, mean, that's, I think that's the same. Yeah, it's the same observation that we were mm. on. That's that's right on the money. And like, um, my my mom, she's a psychologist, and um, she told me once that they, either that she read it or she was part of like that study, that they were trying to match um, psychological um, character types with types of movement, and so what they would do is. Um, in the study is somebody would enter the room and they would throw him a ball like without like just like spontaneously and the way they catch it like some people would be like fluent like would be like you know you can imagine how Nico catches the ball right just like, like puts his hand out yeah he probably puts his hand out and, and just like and and somebody like who's more like anal or just you know just will be just like yeah and um, I'm, I was like ah oh, interesting so that's kind of the that's the same essence right yeah. of like how people how different styles are in mm-hmm. snowboarding and and the, and the originality is the most rare thing it's like we, there's some you know study around this stuff too but it basically like humans when they hang the, the kind of long and short of it is when humans when they hang out with each other they tend to imitate each other mm. you know like yeah. if you go to a you know if i go to a 
party and it's a group of rock climbers, they're all probably going to be wearing seemingly to me the same outfit. If the rock climbers come to my house to a party, we're all probably wearing the yeah. same clothes. And the same goes for tricks and cars and things like that. We just imitate our friends. Whereas like the when you find somebody that I like to describe it as when somebody finds themselves on their snowboard, like you'll see somebody that are like coming up, coming up, and then they just kind of flank left and they're like, nope, uh, this is me over here. And totally. they're like, wow, they just found them. They just found who the fuck they are on their snowboard. And that's the beautiful thing when you, you know, that's what makes the people that we're talking about, the Gigi's and the totally. and Nicholas's and Mark Frank Montoya's. They weren't imitating. They were, they were being themselves. I went, I went snowboarding once with Gigi. I really only went snowboarding a couple times with Gigi, even though we don't live that far from one another. And I think we I feel like through the contest, we've known each other for a long time, but I only went like filming once. I think with Absent or something, we went to like, like a pillow lines in the forest, kind of like just like in the woods, just kind of looking for them. And I remember like someone was like, yeah, um, you know, this is the zone, like try to find a lion. And I like, I was just like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what do I do? You know, like, do we go there? Do we go there? What, like, is there a circle like, of safety over here? <laughs> totally. I'm like, where, <laughs> where's, 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 where's my safety? Where is it? And, and you know, I was like, because I was like, I don't know. Could you go from here to there? I don't know. How, why would I know? And then Gigi's just like dancing down this thing. Just, yeah. And it's funny because I had known him for a while. And he was like, this was like, he was probably filming like with, uh, he had just maybe had his first part with um, Whitey. So that, around that time. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, from the tricks he did, I knew he was good, but like, I was like, when I rode with him, I was like, now I get it. Now I get why people like freak out about how good he is. Cause this is like, I have no business in his zone, you know, like that's just not, and then, yeah, I think it's just like finding your, finding your space. What a great conversation on snowboard philosophy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think that's Getting what there. we call it. Javi, you know, there's a little fun fact about David. He, uh, Neon Magazine named him, uh, one of the 100 most influential young Germans for his work and design. No, yeah, no, actually, no, no, not true. I read that on Wikipedia. I know, but it's not for work, for my work and design, which this is hilarious. Hang on a wait, wait, wait. Hang on, is it your work and fragrance? Oh, <laughs> is it? Shit. Do I know this already? It's my work and fragrance. Yeah. No, no, this is another thing. Because oh, like, your work a guy, in amateur adult films. There's a guy. Danish. Danish. There's a guy, Penis a fragrance large. designer Penis with my name, right? Penis. Not the same name, my name. Penis. Right? Yeah. Penis. Yeah. Did you bring that even up in the first place? I think you sent me something or something. Like, so, but the okay. guy is slowly creeping into my friggin' Google results. He's got the same name as you? Same name as me, and he's a, he's a fragrance designer. He's like a profound <laughs> fragrance designer. He's like yeah. a real popular yeah, one, Yeah, real apparently. popular. Like, you yeah. will find, like, a BBC interview with, like, mm-hmm. the fragrance designer. So he must be super bummed because he's, like, also designer, and, like, this, sh- this shithead snowboarder comes like in. You guys should meet and, like, yeah. capitalize on this. Like, there's some SEO opportunity here yeah, that's or something. That's good. You know? That's pretty good. He's just typing yeah. Wikipedia, just but, pissed off. But, um to the randomness of being named one of the 100 most important young influential <laughs> Germans, which, by the way, I landed like two spots in front of Heidi Klum. Mm. Just, wow. to, just saying. Wow. No big deal. But wow. the funny no thing deal. is just looking at it's that. No big deal. So the guy who made the lists at that magazine, he used to work at a snowboard magazine and knows me. So he's like, <laughs> he, just, he just put that in there. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty awesome. funny. That's pretty, pretty awesome. funny. So there's like really no legitimacy to that, to that whatsoever. And especially everyone around me was like, like just like just like really important activists and stuff. I'm like, yeah, what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, fucking backflips on a on a on, on a ski. <laughs> what do you do? I'm just really bad at snowmobiling mainly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you know what? I forgot There's something a guest important. Qu- There's a guest question. Jake Price. Yeah, yeah. JP Minibike. Here we go. I think this is the one. Yeah. Yo, Chris. What's up, Bombhole? Um, you got David Benedict in the booth today. Uh, on the show lately, there's been a lot of talk about ski versus Polaris. David is true to the Yamamaha. If you can explain that. And who are some of our friends that rode Yamamahas up in Alaska? Love you guys. Later. That question, th- thanks, Jake. Um, I think that question points to, like, a, obviously, like a very, like a funny and great time and uh, of dumb Euro sledheads in Alaska, to the originator ra- originator of the Yahamaha claim, Marco Grills, who was a uh, yeah, like mega shout out to him, and um, who unfortunately passed away um, two years ago, I would say now, two and a half years ago which is still like really 
like it's it's I almost don't have like an emotional relationship to because it doesn't feel that real, you know, because he's like he's one of her crew. And you know how it is like it's like we didn't see each other, but we could pick it up right away, you know. And then then so that I spent so much time with Marco and um, and then to hear that remotely and not being like, you know, like we would maybe like text like, you know, like every every other, no, I mean, maybe like three times a year or something. But um, so, yeah, so maybe for those who don't know, Marco Grills, he was in 91 Words for Snow. And also he was like kind of then part of our crew. He was at every gap session. Yeah, just our, our crew. And when I exited snowboarding, he kind of continued. And I would say maybe went from like a mixture between snowboarding and like influencer lifestyle, I would say. Like it's like a with his whole family who's, who are fucking awesome. And yeah, and then he randomly just like random side country next to the slow pow turn and, and hit a rock with his chest and and um, passed instantly, which it's, it's something, yeah, it's kind of hard to fathom. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I, I mean, I uh, unfortunately, I don't know his wife well, we met. But she seems like the most badass woman on the planet, man. Like, like you know, she, I mean, she yeah. was pregnant um, during the time, and now how she like seeing like what she, like how she kind of takes care of the family, and it's just incredible. And yeah. so, that's a really hard hard loss, and yeah, just a all around good dude. Yeah, it seemed like a really really wonderful dude. And you guys so, helped give him his start too. I feel like. You- his first time I ever saw him was through your your guys's footage. Yeah, it's actually interesting because yeah, because he came up. He had a. I mean, I knew him from like the Euro contest scene. Um, and do you guys remember Air Blasters December? Yep. That yeah. film. Yeah, it was awesome. And they went through Slovenia and also met up with Marco and shredded with him. And maybe that put him a little more on the map again. I was. I knew how good he was all the time. And then. But we were like, oh, that's a kind of a cool story to just have somebody who's like on the come up and bring that into our movie and and um yeah, and just kinda it's like also like in a way passing the torch, like being the worst sledder in the world and then being super lucky and happy that there's somebody who's worse. <laughs> you know, you just like you force someone to buy a sled just because somebody forced you to buy a sled. So same deal kinda. He's but. like, it's a big day for Sylvania. <laughs> I've purchased a new Yahamaha snowmobile. Yeah, he snowmobile. Is. <laughs> yeah. So gangster. There used to be two fucking <laughs> hilarious. It used to be Yahamaha, and he was always like, he was a little bit in the bling, kind of like, like just um, kind of jokingly, but maybe not. But he was like, like at some point he wants he wants like a Berlinger watch, and he was well, what was the Berlinger watch? Like what are the like the the, the well known Rolex? Rolex? No other. Must be Bulgari like, or something. Yeah, like, that's what it like, was. I think it's a Bulgari watch. It's a Berlinger watch. So the Berlinger watch and Yahamaha snowmobile were like, that was when you made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Such a good kid. And the fucking laziest shoveler on the planet, man. <laughs> like seriously. Like we we like to the point where we had started taping, um, we put a tripod up with a time lapse, filming the j- building of the take up to show him later. <laughs> and you could tell, like, on a construction site, there's one guy who's, just like, never walking moves. around, <laughs> not doing anything. Like, he, we have footage of him, like, taking snow from here to there and back and stuff. It's so <laughs> fucking funny. Just refusing to actually yeah. contribute. Yeah, but such a cool dude. Pretty awesome. Just, yeah. Fucking legend. I love that. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to get into a token of the show here, hot takes. Uh, we're going to start it off with... The um, we like to call it the Michael Jordan or the goat, and we like to say as it pertains to you, who's your goat, both male and female, in snowboarding? I'm gonna go Terrier and Mia Brooks. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Woo. Wow! I hope I'm I not mean, putting too much pressure out there, but that's just incredible. Man, you can kind of see that one from a distance, you know. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to take away because that's why I was like, oh man, there's so many awesome women, like. But just that, just recently, I was like, wow, that's yeah. so incredible to watch. It's just mm-hmm. so cool. Such great style, yeah. technique, and just like, it's so hilarious that she like watched and obsessed over Dusty Henriksen because I watched her, I'm like, that's Dusty Henriksen. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's so cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, she's incredible. Okay, would you describe snowboarding more as an art form or sport? Art form. 
Do you want to elaborate a little bit? Um, yeah, I think just, I mean, it can be a sport if it's judged and competitive and it's the athletic element of it, but I think it's about the interpretation of movement or, or, or your personal type style of movement. And, and also the significant element is reacting to the terrain that approach that, that comes at you. And I think that is something when some, but sometimes I try to explain to people who, you know, know nothing about, about snowboarding or why I'm, I was so obsessed about it. I don't think, I don't know if there's another sport where you can interact with your surrounding like elements in that way. Cause I mean, a bike is way too immo like immobile. I mean, it's pretty incredible what they do, but I think in terms of like intuitively being part of that environment and like, you know, like, oh, I'm, this comes up, I'm doing this and this. And I think that's just something. And then in the combination with speed and it's just, yeah. So I think it's definitely an art form. I, I mean, without the pretentious element of saying it's an art form. All right. Uh, who is the most underrated snowboarder in your opinion? Steve Gruber. Ooh. I don't know if you have to draw comparisons, but it's like maybe like European Dirksen meets MFM. It's really weird combination because he like Steve doesn't care about rails, but just the power. Mm. He has got the Travis <clears throat> Rice power. You know the, where you're like, I don't even know where that comes from. Travis is not that big of a dude. It's just like yeah, pure power, pure power, yeah. and and just being able to turn like that's Gruber. Steel or powder? Powder. Mm. Damn. Sorry, sorry guys. I'm Salt Lake. I know yeah, so rail gardens. People seem to get that one wrong quite a bit. Yeah, I tacoed on on one of the rails in the rail garden, like full like stomach taco. That's my only single rail garden experience. That's pretty good. Oh, you can respect that. Have some respect for that. Okay, who, in your opinion, has the best style or your favorite style? Who's got your favorite style ever? Terrier at the time when he wrote the cat board. That's right. subject? Or is that... Maybe a li I'm not... I'm trying to think if he was... I think my, maybe a year before I could see. Hawkinson Factor? No. Probably. Is Hawkinson Factor before... Hawkinson Factor. I, I think so. Yeah, I think... So just in the time when he... Like, just when he... You know, he had, like... Pipe shots in in always in dogger movies from mm -hmm. Hood. Yep, mm -hmm. he was wearing like he's had like a white base yep. and like, damn, that is like, so sharp the way he rides and like, wow, high energy, limber, yeah. athletic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in your opinion, who's got your favorite method? I'm trying not to say the obvious, but I think it might be the obvious. It might be Jamie. Like that. The reason it's obvious. Yeah, the reason it's obvious. But I'm trying to think if there's somebody who's, yeah, but that that's pretty obvious. It's got the best. He, by the way, I did the super, not supernatural. Now it's the natural selection. It used to call, be called supernatural. Yeah, I in went, Jackson. I went to that with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When everyone got diarrhea. That was like on the that was like on the tail end. Like I was almost like. No, like, everyone got diarrhea. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah. Hava, yeah. you got diarrhea. Nobody else got diarrhea. <laughs> no, I, I was miraculously spared. I did think you, I got diarrhea so often. Did you I guys, was one of the only yeah, people he was that didn't get to it. diarrhea. Yeah. Did you guys ever get into him like changing his pants in like a Finnish restaurant? We don't need to go here. This is an <laughs> interview has, about you, David. Well, we'll this finish is, hot takes. Yeah, we can talk about that because yeah. Hava's. I've been with him with like a lot of bowel issues. We can talk about that. It's like every time. By the way, we can just continue with the David Benedict. And David Benedict's a great story. But like seriously. You know what? Let's just let's just stop hot takes and let's continue go, on go, this. Let's get yeah. into hot takes. So hot take. I think it's important. Take, I know, but it's important. We're best method this. ever. And then yeah. yeah. But no, I'm 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 leaving I'm I'm leaving this for. It was Louis in here yet? No. Perfect. You guys, Louis. I mean, you guys can get yeah. all into that. Um, Godfather of my child. So um, I was at the Supernatural, like on the tail end of my career, like maybe kind of like the year before I was out, and it was like. They had the gully run with the different hits. Yep. Mm. And um, Dick Stitch. Dick Stitch, that's right. And um, and I walked across the parking lot after the contest and Jamie judged the contest and he like we walked like we, we saw each other in the parking lot, never spoken to him a word. He just says, um, good method. And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. wow! Can you imagine? Big moment. Yeah. Can you imagine? It's one. so one. funny too because like one. for him it's like he probably is like kind of think I saw <laughs> I saw the guy early. He's like just says something, you know. And like, for me, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm keeping that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like wow. when it, that's better than an X Games gold medal totally. right there. Yeah, yeah, that's big. That's big. Okay, um, so we don't want to 
It will save the Hava shitting yeah, himself. That's, yeah, okay. that's unnecessary. That's he, unnecessary. Right we, when we I picked him at the airport, method. I almost really threw up in the car because uh, he farted right when he got in the truck. It was putrid. It was fucked up. Who are we talking about? You. David. I'm talking about yourself. Okay. Let's go to your favorite video part. Your favorite um, video ever made. Favorite video ever made. Read it correctly. Is I'll there a video of you barfing when you when you smell the? Uh, we were talking you, snowboard the video. The here. Yeah, mustard. Yeah, mustard. Video oh, tell this story. Dude, Let's tell the story. I tried to convince yes. him at an Austrian yeah, restaurant. I, I was. I think I was to, there. I was. I was there for that. No, you were. No, for the barfing, the story you were there, right? But, but for I'm the trying to convince somebody, I was with somebody trying to convince Hava. Yeah, I, I tried here. to convince yeah. you because it was like white German, like Bavarian white sausage, and usually yeah. is with uh, sweet with mustard. The mustard. I and this. the sweet mustard, and I was like seriously trying to look out for it. I was like, no, no, no. I know you have a mustard trauma, which you might be able to get into or not. No, David Benedict interview. First of all, explain the mustard trauma. I, if if you don't, I will. <laughs> Are we really doing this you right now? You have a, this is like a yep. huge you have, derailment. You have, you have a choice. You have a choice to tell your story or right. have it. All right, yeah. thirty second version. All right, I'm okay. a kid at summer camp. I got a big. The counselor's like, "Hey, Hava, you want to help us uh, put the food out?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, of course." She hands me a one of those big things of mustard, and I struggle to open. I open it, and it splatters like 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 goes all over me. I instantly just like barf all over the food, like all over everything, and like. The whole camp sees it and starts just like laughing at me. So then I'm just like throwing up, crying, grossed out. Ever since then, I smell mustard and it just like triggers a gag reflex. So uh, it's trauma. If you guys want to like indulge in my trauma, yes, we would like to. It's good. Exactly. And it's, it's real. I, like mustard, it's, if he gets around it, it's not a good situation. Now continue yeah. your story. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think he threw up. You just like. You're, no, that's the only time in my life I had let it cross my lips. Yeah. But it was like a little yeah. smear, and I, I was close to throwing up. It was a, yeah, I it was a huge leap of faith. Yeah. It wasn't, and I, I, since then, every single time, no, no kidding, every time I eat sweet mustard, I'm like, I think of you, and I'm like, yeah, it does taste a little bit like mustard. It tasted terrible, whatever yeah. it was. And also, yeah. you're the only person that could peer pressure Hava into doing that ever. Because it was coming from That's you. It was coming there's, from you. Yeah, there's. We've tried all kinds of stuff. It was compelling pitch because you were like, no, 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 it doesn't taste anything like. But that's mustard. what this I is thought. This like really it's special. Like... You're in Europe. You only live once. Yeah. You Yolo. Know, and, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. Anyways, best snowboard video. Favorite. Oh, yeah, what's snowboard your favorite video? snowboard video of all time? Uh, resistance. Uh, what about favorite video part singular? Probably. Maybe J.P. Walker and the Resistance. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite snowboard graphic that's ever been made? For maybe Terrier's Cat. Could be Terrier's Cat. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd go with Terrier's Cat. Okay. If you could go uh, heliboarding with three people, good times, wiggling down some pow, uh, no cameras, who's going in the heli with you? you got three seats. Three seats. Um, I would take my brother, Boris, my best friend, Minnie, and... Christoph for the good times. Mm. There you go. I, d I should have included you can take celebrities too because Young Dolly took Mike Tyson. I forgot <laughs> to include that. I don't know if that changes anything, but just <laughs> we'll move on. Can uh, you imagine him like punching the snow because it's like <laughs> it's not working out? <laughs> Mike Tyson. So uh, if you, uh, this is an interesting one. Pants over the high backs or under the high backs? Because uh, that's interesting. I've never even thought about putting them over the high backs. Like were, in, in terms of, in terms of, yeah, you really have to kind of go out of your way. Yeah, I think so. I think you were yeah. over the high backs back in the day. Maybe you I'm were. I was just trying I'm, to think, but you think it's like maybe that was. It's not. It can't be. It has to be intentional, right? Yes. I think you so. think it was over the high backs? Huh. I'm almost 100 percent sure. I mean, if it was, then, you know, going back to like emulating, probably JP did it. I was like, mm, yeah, he does it. I do it. <laughs> you know. I like that. Uh, if you had a dream sponsor, any brand in the world doesn't have to be snowboard related. What's your dream sponsor? I was gonna go for a special blend. Oh wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. That'd be pretty cool. You know, like like camo puffy coats for days, and you get like two. You're like, oh, this was a shitty idea. <laughs> I should have like <laughs> should have taken Home Depot. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, in my 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 uh, sixteen year old snowboard me would definitely go with special blend, yeah. and. Yeah. Um, I think now I'd probably pick like a good restaurant. 
like a really good like McDonald's, something I mean, like that. Leica, if you're listening, I don't currently have a camera sponsor, and I am available. I can assure you that they're not listening, Hava. So you're good on that. Just in case. Just in yep. case. Uh, okay, and then uh, last question we have for hot takes is worst trend. What didn't really stick, but was tried for a second, is boots out a uh, tongue, boot tongue outside the pants. Mm. That was tried for like two months, I think, and then it disappeared. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was something that was tried. The double tongue? No, uh, just like the like the the boot, like the tongue. Yep. Would be outside of your pants, so it'd be like you know, and like then how you'd still lace it. You and like I think smush the pants. No, in there? no, you don't. You or you just kind of lace to the ankles. Kinda. You lace to the ankles. You leave the the tongue out. You know, kind of like on like old school like basketball shoes yep. when you had like the huge tongue and would yep. come out. Or wasn't it like on skate shoes too? Yeah, the puffy oh, yeah. tongue, like double tongue. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of like an attempt to do that. Which I mean, now I'm speaking just purely uh, aesthetically. It just didn't look good. Mm. I thought, but I like I mean, that. Um, Great answer. Um, like the retro retro trend is a great one. I'm I'm backing that. Okay, what snowboard are you currently riding? We always ask setups, so the yeah. people need to know what yeah. what's your uh, what's your stick. So I'm I think I've been riding like a Salmon six stick for like the last fifteen years or something. And yeah. and uh, they changed it like a couple years ago, and then I started then I switched to to like a dance hall and dance hall, but now they I think they realized the, f- the original six stick was better, so they changed it. So now um, I'm back on a six stick, which mm. is, I mean, it's like a go to quiver board. killer, just one one board, you know, and carves like a Ferrari, and it's just a really good, good board. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, you know what? I'm going to throw in another one. We stopped doing it, but Hava suggested it earlier um, words to live by. Hard hitting. Wow. No pressure. Ooh, I, yeah, okay. It's interesting because I spoke to Mikey two nights ago about kind of something similar, like life approaches and stuff. And I remembered um, this quote from um, a French philosopher, Simone Weil, and I'd only read it in German. I tried to like, translate it literally, and then we Googled it. And it went something like, to touch the impossible... You have to work on the possible. I might have to look that up. Wait, hold on a second. It's because it's really, it's like, it's basically what it's trying to say is like, if you want to create something that is like magical, you have to kind of work on the non-magical because that's the only thing we have access to. You know, it's basically just work on it and, you know, just stay at, stay, stay at it. But I think it's kind of cool because it doesn't say that there's nothing magical out there. It's just that it's not necessarily directly attainable, you know? You might be able to create something that's really, really cool, but A, it's not going to be, like, the first draft, and B, you can't really, like, um, plan with it, I'd say. So I think it's a, it's kind of nice because you're like, yeah, I think there's, you know, magical stuff out there, I think, but you just have to stay with it and just do, like, the shit before it becomes like you know like the piece of shit because it, because before it comes like a masterpiece without even having to be a masterpiece in the sense that like you're celebrated just in order to have something that's like magical. I I feel that that's beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, that's killer. That's beautiful. Okay, um, and then uh, what's next for David Benedict? Um, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Maybe I'm not trying to. Maybe I'm not trying to find out. That's I'm like, in like a good, like kind of fluid state of like things come and go, and I'm like, um, I don't know. Try not to expect anything. Great answer. Probably the best answer we've ever had for that question in the history of the bomb hole. I love that. In my opinion, if I'm going to judge your answer, which I just did, <laughs> if I'm going to be judging, yeah, watching, judging, look at the baby, look yeah. at the baby. <laughs> All right. Um, any thank yous before we wrap this thing up, David? Uh, wow. I'm almost thinking like too many. Um, but maybe, um, like, maybe just like my brother for putting me like onto snowboarding, but more so, I think, just like, uh, like, thank for like the, 
how do you say the um, like the the random chance of being of having been enabled through my parents and everything and through b luck where I was yeah. born to being able to do this um, maybe one and then just snowboarding like that was you know like these couple of days were so fucking cool for just being like oh yeah you know like just grateful to have been a part of it and have and 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 know and, and kind of belong to this tribe to some extent you know and that's yeah just so thanks for everyone who was like involved in that path and because if i start many naming people yeah, the list um, will go on forever yeah, yeah exactly so yeah that's everyone a part of the tribe that's a well well said well david we did it i'm so it. thankful that you came yeah, and thanks, chatted guys. with us it's been yeah, it's been great a pleasure uh, so thank you hava yeah hey thanks hava for coming out oh thank you guys it's been wonderful it's been it's been a real treat getting to chat with both of you guys. Absolutely. Uh, Silk D, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you, guys. It's been a blast. Thanks to our tribe, as David put it, and also all of our listeners, uh, all the snowboarders, all the Patreon members, all the sponsors. Thanks for enabling us to do this show. We appreciate you guys. And one last thing. Yeah, and thanks to you guys. Um, Chris, I'm, I meant it when I said it the other day that it's, in, it's very unique and special that you've created this place for, for snowboard culture, and that's like... It's really cool, you know, like you tune, like people who are so far away from the current state of snowboarding, like tune in and it's like, it's become this like nucleus, you know, so. I'll echo, I'll echo that. Yeah, totally. Thank you guys. Thanks. Totally Epic. smokes. Yeah. That's really special to hear. So thank you. All right. We got another podcast coming at you guys next Wednesday. Have a great week. Thanks guys. Wow. Woo. David. All right. Hey, thanks, guys.